If you can dodge a bottle, you can dodge a ball. <laughs> if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. What? Oh! The Ballad of Papa Pirate, The Outhouse Incidents, Tales of Revenge. I know revenge is a pretty popular theme around here. And from a storytelling perspective, revenge always works because you always end up getting vengeance on the person who did you wrong, right? So <laughs> it should be relatively wholesome, I think. Except it mentions an outhouse right in the title. So yeah, it is this poop, probably. <laughs> that always makes me laugh. Hi, Red X. Hi, ah, you're the Irish pirate. Hi, Red X fans. Yeah, they're here too, I hope. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a new Red exclusive saga. Oh, he's using the branding. Perfect. <laughs> if it goes well, that's true. If it goes well, maybe nobody watches it and they'll be like, oh, I, I want to do that again. <laughs> if not, then, you know, hey, worth a try. Variety is the spice of life, and I thought that I would try something new. I'm still working on Star Wars shenanigans, but I'm also going to add some new content of a different variety. Well, I do thank you, user Irish Pirate, for, for helping me to spread my legs and whatnot. I can spread my wings and fly. Maybe we'll find some other cool new subreddits that people would actually be interested in. Some of you might have picked up on the fact that I can be spiteful and vindictive from time to time. Dude wrote a whole parody song about a mean comment that he got. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I might have picked up on that a little bit. I try not to be, but when provoked, I tend to forget my manners. And I say or do things that would make my mama take a switch to me even as a grown-ass man. Well... All this, I came by it honest. <laughs> it ain't easy being this vindictive, but I came by it honest. <laughs> Honestly, I, I do get where you're coming from. Like, if somebody is a jerk, even in just like a Snapchat post or something, I will drop a firebomb on them. And people in the comments are like, Red X, stop it, he's already dead. I'm like, no, I say when he's dead. I say when we're finished. Like a little Breaking Bad Heisenberg quote or something like that. <laughs> we're done. When I say we're done. This is a tale all about my dad. Papa Pirate is what we're going to call him. His exploits should explain the proxemics between the apple and the tree. Don't fall far from what I gather. <laughs> I mean, Ramtide is the true Papa Pirate, but I suppose we could have Papa Pirate in this story. And then we got Papa Pirate in the Discord. It's so strange that we got like so many pirates, but we don't advocate downloading movies or anything. I definitely never talked about that on the channel in my last r slash nice guys video. <laughs> oh, you've all seen through my ruse. All right. <laughs> Papa Pirate was born in 1950, so the outhouse incidents took place around the end of the summer in 1962. Little 12-year-old boy, he grew up poor. Dirt ass poor. His grandparents lost everything in the 1930s. His mom was unemployed and already starting to develop symptoms of Parkinson's disease around this time, and his dad was distant. I think most fathers in the 50s were fairly distant, but I am sorry to hear that about his mom. Like, that is a rough pill to swallow, isn't it? To be clear, uh, the father was not physically distant, except when he was at work at the cotton mill or with one of his mistresses. Yeah, cheating on his wife while she was dealing with the onset of a disease that was gradually making her lose control of her body. Eh, swell guy. I'm sure there were decent dudes in the 50s <laughs> but we all have this picture kind of painted like i i can't say that i'm even really shocked by any of this which is sad in a way i'm sure there were some legitimately good dudes out there but from what i gather grandpa pirate is not one of them so yes emotionally distant to take a quote from iron man 2 i don't think my grandpa ever told my dad that he loved him never even said that he liked him and did I mention that they were poor? This was a time in which indoor plumbing was a thing, 
and everyone in his neighborhood was still pumping well water and using outhouses. It wasn't exactly banjo territory, but it was at least a y'all ain't from around here, is ya? type of environment. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, do you know how to get to town? Yeah, it's back the way you came. I mean, I'm sure they're lovely people if you get to know them. The problem is they don't want to get to know you. <laughs> <laughs> get on out of here, boy. I ain't seen you and I don't like you. <laughs> Those outhouses are part of this tale's supporting cast. Aw, oh, they're filled with poop. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Ramtide told me how terrible outhouses are. You gotta go out there in the middle of winter and chip away at poop ice. <laughs> so you can take a shit without a poopsicle touching your beehole. <laughs> uh, oh, that is funny. Really, really disgusting. I don't ever want to experience it, but <laughs> from a distance, it's really funny. Uh... Uh, Dad says there wasn't a whole lot to do when he was a kid, except ride his bike and get into mischief with his friends. Yep, welcome to the days before TVs and smartphones, man. They was just out there causing a ruckus. I wish my kids would cause more of a ruckus. <laughs> there were a pair of brothers in his neighborhood that were in their 30s or 40s at the time, and they were notoriously violent alcoholics. You stay away from them. <laughs> They worked at the same cotton mill as my grandpa, but whereas he at least had the decency to set some of the money aside for his family, what he didn't spend on his mistresses at least, these guys took their paychecks to the liquor store. Aw, oh, leave them alone, OP. They're just thirsty. <laughs> I'm really, really thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> they hated my dad and his friends. They were kids. They were loud, as children are wont to be. And loud kids don't mix well with hangovers. Well, you want me to cry you a river? You did this to yourself. <laughs> I'm supposed to tiptoe around because you chose to do this to yourself? Eat a dick. <laughs> dad says he was a top-notch dodgeball player back then because he was used to dodging empty bottles on a near daily basis. <laughs> if you could dodge a bottle, you could dodge a ball. <laughs> if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. What? Oh. Uh, Papa Pirate. Hey, they were some mean sons of bitches, but me and my friends decided we would earn half of it. They threw bottles at us and whew, we threw them right back. They messed with us, we mess with them twice as hard. Sean Connery in The Untouchables. They throw a bottle. We throw a slingshot. They send one of ours to the pavement. We send one of theirs to the hospital. That's the rural North Carolina way. And Sean Connery. Sorry for that accent. I don't know how well that went. <laughs> it's hard if I'm not like practicing it and listening to it immediately. The whole recording's done in one shot, so I just... Uh, do what I think it sounds like and hope that it turns out well. <laughs> you guys will let me know. Yeah, something like that. So, how did the outhouse incidents begin? Well, twas the summer of 62, fall fastly approaching, when my dad and his friends were riding their bikes and they got ambushed. Oh, snap. These 30-year-olds are picking on some 12-year-olds? <laughs> Come on now. The brothers had been waiting for them behind their fence and popped up as the pint-sized Sons of Anarchy rumbled past, complete with playing cards attached to the tire forks so the spokes would make a loud rattling sound when they popped across the cardboard. That does sound awesome. Why don't kids do that anymore? Makes you sound like you're really riding a bike. Uh, I did that. I guess these kids ain't got playing cards no more. It's all like downloadable Hearthstone cards or something. <laughs> uh, uh, my dad and his friends didn't have much time to react before a barrage of glass and empty cans caught them in the flank. No one was too seriously injured, but they had some bruises. 
Those that fell from their mounts had scraped knees and hands to tell the tale of their plight. This meant war. Yeah, I don't understand why you're doing all this to a bunch of kids. <laughs> I guess you really got nothing better going on in your life. I mean, just imagine it. It's the 60s. You don't have a TV, no internet, no phones. All you could do is really drink all day when you get home from the cotton mill. No hobbies aside from said drinking, and so you decide to start war with a bunch of literal children? <laughs> Let's go assault those kids. That seems like a good pastime. Ugh. For as romanticized as the past is, it sounds like hell. <laughs> I like the current year, and I don't ever want to go back. Thank you. I mean, according to Papa Pirate, this was already war, but this particular action definitely called for some retaliation. That retaliation came in the form of a nighttime raid on the brothers' backyard. <laughs> yeah, don't mess with kids. They got just as much free time as you do. More, even! You could have been good friends. You could have just ignored each other like most humans do, but no. <laughs> you had to escalate. And so here it goes. You know, it's going to turn into a bloodbath before you know it. Hatfields, McCoys, apparently one of the comments said that was over a pig. But why shouldn't it be over somebody getting pelted with beer bottles and cans? <laughs> when the boys were confident that the brothers were passed out for the time being... They crept into the yard and lifted the outhouse. These were not fixed structures, mind you. They were wooden boxes situated over deep holes. When one got a little too full, the idea was to dig a new one and cover the old one with dirt. They didn't hide the outhouse. They didn't destroy it. They just moved it ever so slightly backwards. <laughs> uh, about four feet. And then they covered the hole with some sticks and a thin layer of dirt. And then they waited. <laughs> God, this is so devious. I love it. <laughs> Would I have ever thought to do this? I don't know, man. This is hilarious. Yes, bring me the poopy drunk hoods. <laughs> They're not poopy yet, but they will be. They will be. <laughs> Dad says they were hiding behind the fence for hours. If I had been out after dark, my dad would have come tracking me down like a bloodhound and pulled me back home by the scruff of the neck. Probably because he didn't want me to end up in the same kind of shenanigans that he had gotten into. Oh, come on. This is a part of the evolution into manhood. You got to make somebody fall into a hole filled with their own poop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited too. I could wait for hours, but luckily we don't have to wait for our gratification. So dad said they were about to give up and just go home when they heard the telltale sound of a screen door. They peeked over the wall and saw one of the brothers staggering down the steps to his back porch and unfastening his pants. He clearly had to go and go he did down. <laughs> Uh, he stepped on the branches and gave a cry of surprise as he slipped and fell into a pit of despair. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what we'll call it. Despair. <laughs> Dad said there wasn't really a splash so much as a loud squish. <laughs> Followed by a rapid fire demonstration of every profane word that the English language had to offer. <laughs> uh, God, it's such just desserts. Maybe it is an escalation, you know? You got hit with a beer bottle, you made him swim in his own poop. <laughs> uh, how could you possibly outdo this one, though? Oh. Uh. Had the boys managed to contain their laughter, they might have been able to retain some plausible deniability. That prank could have been pulled off by anyone. <laughs> yeah, right. They might as well have autographed it. <laughs> I mean, how could you not laugh at something like that? Especially after waiting for hours, having it all built up, 
And then it's just as glorious as it was in your mind. <laughs> God damn. Uh, the score was settled. The scales were leveled. Perfectly balanced. As all things should be. Yeah, I don't know if that's 100% correct, though. <laughs> <laughs> One of these pranks seems uh, a bit more devastating than the other. These are just the first couple of steps down what I'm sure will be a very, very long path. A week or so later, they had ridden their bikes down to the graveyard, and they were stick fighting, playing make-believe and, as boys are wont to do, uh, being boys. They didn't notice until it was too late that the brothers were picking up their bikes and starting to walk away with them. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, escalation. Papa Pirate and one of his buddies managed to give the pinata treatment to the brother that was taking their bikes. He dropped them and took a couple of ill-aimed swings and ran when some of the other boys provided suppressing fire with rocks and chunks of busted asphalt. Theft, assault, <laughs> vandalism. Where does it end? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. It is a funny story. You're like, oh, look at these kids assaulting these adults. But yeah, these adults could probably do something terrible to these kids. Maybe it's just part of growing up in like a sheltered culture. <laughs> My brain jumps to the worst possible scenarios immediately. So yeah, it seems funny, haha, but I can see how this would go off the rails pretty quick. <laughs> I have some trepidation. The older brother did get away with one of the bikes. The boys chased him down to a pond, but they didn't get there in time to stop him from discus tossing it into the murky brown pool. Whoop. <laughs> the kid went in after it and was able to fish it out along with a fine collection of leeches. Oh, God. They got leeches in North Carolina? I mean, I was out there for A school at one point when I got out of Navy boot camp, but uh, I never went swimming. One of the boys suggested moving the outhouse again, but Papa Pirate had a different idea. One that he says he's ashamed of to this day, but apparently not ashamed enough to keep it to himself. <laughs> and if he didn't chuckle when telling it, I might actually believe that he had some regrets. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm totally ashamed. Really, that's just something that you say. I'm so ashamed of my actions. Awesome though they were. Sit down, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Dad filled a mason jar with sugar water and left it near the wall. This was summertime and his area was plagued by yellow jackets this time of year. If you've never encountered yellow jackets, you're lucky. They are not as deadly as some variety of wasps, but they are very aggressive and they're drawn to soda or anything sugary, like a jar of sugar water, for example. <laughs> I'm starting up my yellow jacket collection this year. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I have run into them, but I just let them take what they want. I'm like, okay, you want some soda here? <laughs> I'll pour one out for you. <laughs> now leave me alone. Uh, they checked the jar every day and topped it off. Word got out that a free meal was available, and the swarm grew in size every day. Oh, God. <laughs> How many yellow jackets we talking? When the boys were satisfied at the size of their army, they waited until a Friday night and moved the mason jar into the brothers' outhouse. <laughs> their nemesis wouldn't have to work the next day, you see, and so this revenge scheme could only be done in daylight. The obvious reason for moving the jar at night would be because they didn't want to get caught. The other, and in some ways more practical reason, was because even little hate flies have to sleep sometime, I think. I'm not an entomologist. <laughs> I assume you are correct, but I can really only relate it to the beard sciences. Beards have to sleep a lot. I think insects sleep less. Maybe. <laughs> if they tried moving the jar during the day, it would have ended poorly. Try to move the buffet while people are still in line, and you become the enemy. <laughs> I, I was thinking, like, you know, just seal them up in the jar or something and break the jar in the outhouse. But this way, 
they are sure to like stay inside of the outhouse. I swear to God, dude, these 12 year olds, they are so clever. <laughs> How would I ever come up with something like this? I wouldn't, especially not at 12. What the hell? So the gang reconvened on Saturday morning, but not for Saturday morning cartoons. Cause one, I don't even know if that was a thing back then. And two, none of their families could afford televisions. I think it was almost definitely a thing, but yeah, if you ain't got a TV, don't worry about it. <laughs> Instead, the youthful band of miscreants decided to casually play near the brother's fence. Haha, <laughs> so innocent. <laughs> Just doing kid things, you know? We got our jacks and our marbles, our toy guns, our logging chains, our baseball cards. You know, the usual logging chains. <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> uh, I guess you play with what you got. <laughs> Whatever. When one of the brothers came stumbling out of the door, he yelled at them all to clear off before he hopped the fence and kicked their asses. They grumbled and started to pack up. Satisfied that his threat had landed, the brother decided to make use of the facilities. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you enjoy yourself. I will be out of here in a minute. In fact, we're all going to be out of here in just a minute. <laughs> the door had barely closed when my dad and his pals leaped into action. They hopped the fence and team carried the chain in a mad dash to the outhouse. Oh, they're going to lock him in. <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. That's what the logging chain is for. They weren't playing with it. They were plotting with it. <laughs> These kids are devious, bro. <laughs> Their victim managed to half yell and uh, what the f before he heard the clatter of metal on wood. The boys looped the chain around the outhouse and tied the ends together with some more rope that they ran between the links. The brother inside beat against the walls screamed and demanded his immediate release. There were yellow jackets pouring from the vent now. <laughs> the boys ran, not wanting to get caught in the crossfire. Bro, oh God, it's so evil. Not only do you have to smell your own poopies, but you're getting attacked by wasps. Actually, the wasps are probably the uh, more important thing <laughs> in that comparison. Oh, can you die from too many yellow jacket stings? <laughs> this is horrible. Well, yeah, I guess he deserved it. They made it across the street before they saw the outhouse rock back and forth until it toppled over onto its side and its unfortunate inhabitant tried to escape. He didn't even pull his pants back up and he went face first into the dirt. <laughs> uh, uh, oh. He's still drunk, I guarantee it. The gang didn't stick around long enough to see what happened next. They decided that the far-ass other side of town would be a great place to spend the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, maybe the next town over, spend the rest of your life. This is... Ugh, there's going to be another escalation. I guarantee it. You thought getting your bike thrown in a lake was bad? <laughs> then again, they might be too drunk to come up with... Uh, schemes as clever as these kids until this point the fight had stayed purely between the brothers and the papa pirate crew neither side had involved parents the two factions hated each other but they were at least willing to adhere to the national policy of snitching and its cause and effect relationship to sutures <laughs> just know that when they run and whine to your parents that means you really won. <laughs> they had no other recourse at this point. When the boys got home, however, they learned that this gentleman's agreement had come to an end. The parents had been informed. Apparently, the brothers felt that weaponizing insects was just a step too far. <laughs> you be the judge on if you agree or not. That's a tough one, dude. This is not a black and white scenario, all right? <laughs> <laughs> like they threw beer bottles at the kids. Okay, they fell into their own poop. 
<laughs> they had their bikes stolen. They locked the dude in an outhouse and had him get devoured by wasps. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe these kids are taking it a step too far, you know? Although you would just hope that the brothers would learn that, that they're going to get beaten every single time. Just stop. <laughs> it's fine. Let kids be kids, you know? Really smart people know when they are beaten, all right? <laughs> so what happened? One of the bushes behind my dad's house was missing a willowy branch. <laughs> And for some reason, poor Papa Pirate wasn't able to sit comfortably for about a week. His friends got similar punishments. Solidarity through corporal punishment, I guess. Yeah, them's was the time, I suppose. But then, something else also happened. The brothers stopped throwing bottles. They stopped yelling at the roving band of hooligans. Whether or not you consider the boys' actions to be petty war crimes or not, the Yellowjack Gambit ended the war. Neither side would ever like the other, but the brothers either feared an escalation of retribution or had developed a begrudging level of respect for their adversaries. As well they should, dude. <laughs> like I said, you're getting beaten at every turn. Just, just back away. Maybe they're smarter than I give them credit for. Props to them for, for taking their lumps and knowing when to end it. <laughs> They're like, okay, this is never going to be over if we keep it going. Either way, the outhouse incidents were resolved and relative peace returned to the community until school started back at least. And then would come the time for my dad to get bullied for being poor. Ugh, Papa Pirate had been on the receiving end of that for years, but either his wasp-based revenge scheme had emboldened him or his testosterone was finally telling him, ENOUGH IS ENOUGH! <laughs> Either way, the brothers wouldn't be the only ones to taste the wrath of Papa Pirate that year, but that will be a tale for another time. I know this isn't the usual kind of content that gets put on the subreddit, maybe it'll go over like a lead balloon, but I figured it would be worth at least a bit of the old college try. Part of me is tempted to pick a 1960s song to parody for this, but part of me thinks that I should save the parodies for Star Wars shenanigans and other beard tales. A little bit of separation, you see? So would you settle for some limericks instead? Yes, I I'm grateful for any of the art form that you provide. Thank you so much. <laughs> there once were two drunken bros. My dad and his friends were the foes. The feuding got bitter, and the kids moved the shitter, and into the muck a bro goes. <laughs> the rivalry score had been tied, but bros got revenge for their pride. The kids used their brains, wrapped the outhouse in chains, with wasps and their victim inside. <laughs> Limericks are pretty cool. They don't all have to be dirty, unless you consider, you know, falling in a bunch of poop dirty. I guess it is a dirty limerick. In a different type of way, though. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the story. If it's well received, I'll write some more. Like how my dad dropped out of high school in a I'm surprised they didn't press charges grand finale. Or how he gave me irrefutable proof that my dad could beat up your dad. <laughs> or others. If not, then all right. I'll see you guys for the next Star Wars shenanigan tale. Until then, stay safe and don't pick fights with kids that have nothing to lose. <laughs> Edit. I consulted Papa Pirate after writing this to make sure I got the details right. Papa Pirate said, uh, Mostly, you forgot the BB guns. <laughs> Irish Pirate says, Wait, what? Papa Pirate, they didn't just throw bottles at us. They would shoot us with BB guns when we rode by too. Just make sure whoever reads this knows that the drunks always started it. What we did back then was their own damn fault, really. Uh, that's true. <laughs> you reap what you sow. Thanks for the clarification, Papa Pirate. Throwing bottles? I mean, it's a dick move, but it doesn't seem too bad. But BB guns? You're a 30-year-old man shooting 12-year-old children with, with BB guns. Yeah, you deserve to fall into a pile of your own shit. <laughs> <laughs> This left the local bullies with no alternative but to try and seek out some, uh, softer targets. 
targets that wouldn't play an acoustic set of Wipeout on their faces. <laughs> Wipeout. <laughs> the Ballad of Papa Pirate. The Tragedy of Tiny Tim. Oh, he plays a ukulele and he's got a really high voice. Remember that silly? Warning, this story has a mixture of humor and heaviness. Oh God, is Tiny Tim like disabled in, in some type of way? <laughs> is his dad Bob Cratchit? Are we just reliving a Christmas story out of season? <laughs> I don't really know. Again, I guess we'll have to see. It's got a lot of my usual sarcastic flair, but the ending is far from comedic. I didn't cry writing it. You cried writing it. <laughs> oh my God, dude. I'm gonna have to brace myself for what happens here. I am not scared of a heavy story, but man, I don't know if I'm ready to get like super deep into my feels today. Fingers crossed. It's gonna be fine. It's all normal. <laughs> this is part two of the Ballad of Papa Pirate, a red exclusive saga, beautiful branding, that doesn't really have a specific category. Some parts are pro revenge, some parts are Chadtopia, in my opinion, but it's my dad, so I might be a little bit biased. You don't necessarily need to read or listen to part one, but it can be found over here on user the Irish Pirate 18's Reddit profile or on my YouTube channel, which I talked about at the beginning of the video, remember? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> the only importance that carries over to this episode is the fact that standing up to a pair of alcoholic brothers over the summer filled my dad with as much piss and vinegar as the last vat of balsamic to be inspected by a disgruntled employee before quitting in a someone call security level meltdown. I mean, that's not too bad. Call security, that doesn't mean he brought a Kalashnikov into the office and started <laughs> walking down the halls, pumping rounds into friends and co-workers. <laughs> Remember, no Russian. Uh, I think that's acceptable. Let's take a trip back to the fall of 1962, the spring of 1963, shall we? Oh, you want me to be in two places at once? I don't think that's how a timeline works. Uh, I'm gonna do my best, though. <laughs> I suppose that we shall, seeing as I'm steering the time machine. I know that some of you might want to stop off at the 80s, but you're not missing that much. If you keep complaining, I'll stop long enough to make you try new Coke. That'll shut you up. Unless you like the taste of Tab. <laughs> then you'd be like, oh, I'm gonna stay in the 80s. Let's do some new Coke and some old Coke. You know what I mean? Ooh. Cocaína. <laughs> so, uh, where were we? Oh, yes. 1962. Papa Pirate grew up poor. Ever since he started school, he had been teased and tormented by some of the kids at his school who took his poverty as a valid excuse to just be super shitty to him. They were all 12-year-olds at the time of this particular tale, and in case you haven't met a 12-year-old lately, let me refresh your memory. They are the goddamn worst! Oh, I thought that was like a recent development. I thought 12-year-olds were cool while I was a 12-year-old, and then they just got worse as I got older. But no, the fact is, 12-year-olds stayed the same. It's me who has changed. <laughs> you see, in the 1930s and 40s, there was a German-American psychologist named Eric Erickson. And I know it might sound like I'm making that up, but I'm not. <laughs> that, uh, okay. Let me just paint this in broad strokes for you. As we go through life, we move from one stage of development to another. Starting around the age of 12, we transition from the industry versus inferiority, where we start to establish our competencies and realize that maybe our shit does in fact stink, to identity versus confusion. This is the age where our sense of self starts to get weird and fuzzy it, it, it starts growing hair in strange new places oh no we can't talk about that <laughs> it just pumped the brakes for a little bit 
It happened to me. It happened to you. It's going to happen to everybody else, but we're not going to talk about it. This is the 60s, okay? We have to all be repressed or something like that. <laughs> Essentially, everything is changing. You just got to the point where you accepted the fact that you can't do everything, and now you're supposed to figure out who you are and what you can do. God, it took me from the age of 12 to about 30 <laughs> to figure out what I'm capable of doing. Isn't that terrifying? What a long stint of your life to just uh, not know what you can do. What better way to distract yourself from all of that by just, you know, picking on the poor kid, right? I mean, look at him. He doesn't even have shoes that fit. You can see his toes through them. You better remind him that he's poor before he... Uh, wait, why is he balling up his fist? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's fair news, you know? Talk shit, get hit. You never heard that? That wasn't a thing in the 60s? <laughs> Go ahead, let it happen. For seven years, he had been putting up with his classmates, giving him more crap than the unfortunate winner of the lifetime supply of Curly Cow Pie's 100% organic fertilizer. Doesn't taste good. I tried it. Cow pie is not the same as moon pie, okay? <laughs> you need to be very careful what you put in your mouth. But... If Papa Pirate could trap a couple of drunks three times his age in a wasp-filled outhouse, what else could he do? Ah, uh, yes. Now we are exploring our sense of self. And yeah, I guess that's Papa Pirate's secret talent. <laughs> Shoving people in outhouses and making them get stung by angry insects. <laughs> well, he could dish out a couple of skull rattlers to the loudest of his tormentors, of course. Yes! Uh, revenge! Victory! <laughs> Onward! By the spring of 1963, word was out that old penniless Papa Pirate was prepared for a proper presentation of prepubescent pugilism, pending people's pension for perpetually poking fun at the impoverished plight. <laughs> uh, oh, the alliteration again! Mwah! Beautiful! It's my favorite part, honestly. This left the local bullies with no alternative but to try and seek out some, uh, softer targets. Targets that wouldn't play an acoustic set of Wipeout on their faces. <laughs> Wipeout. <laughs> they had to choose carefully, though. They learned rather quickly that it wasn't just Papa Pirate that was off-limits. Many a time he would stride triumphantly into the principal's office with bruised knuckles after coming to the defense of someone else. Yeah, I love that. The bully bullies. The people that bully the bullies. That's what I did in high school. I wouldn't let nobody pick on my friends. I'm like, okay, you think my friend's nerdy? We're gonna throw down for that. He's tiny, but guess what? I'm not. <laughs> uh, and I was quite proud of that. I still am to this day. I would do the same fucking thing. Even as a 30 plus year old man, I, I would choose to do the same thing. Um, so all things considered, all this was really downright unfair for the bullies. Oh, the poor bullies. <laughs> How were they supposed to form sociopathic identities at the expense of others? If every attempt was met with Papa Pirate, serving them a plate of candied beets. <laughs> Enter. Tiny Tim. Oh, Tiny... Not Tiny Tim. God damn it. This tale took place before the time in which polio was eliminated in the United States. Yeah, that's... That's a relevant statement. This is where the story is going, so pack your luggage, because we are going on a goddamn trip. Oh my god, he really is Tiny Tim, isn't he? He's not a funny ukulele playing boy. He, he's, he's a boy whose legs don't work. Jesus, I hate this already. Let's just pause the episode real quick to give a big shout out to Jonas Salk, okay? <laughs> Thank you for the polio vaccine. God bless. Tim, as you might have pieced together, did indeed have polio. He was a wheelchair bound 12 year old boy whose family had recently relocated to Papa Pirate's waters. Waters in which the sharks had not been allowed to feed 
for months. And he was, he was not well received. Oh my God, dude. The wheelchair kid? Y y you really gonna do that? Come on. Didn't we learn better from the BK Kids Club? Y'all remember wheels from the BK Kids Club? That's how you know we're inclusive. <laughs> uh, uh, this is why I say like, yeah, teenagers today might sort of be dicks, but it's nothing compared to how like quick they were to ostracize people in every, every fucking decade before this one. You know what I mean? So Papa Pirate himself had been out sick when Tim joined the class, or maybe he'd been on in-home suspension. He, he didn't really remember when I asked him, but yeah, that's pretty unfortunate for Tim, I will say. Either way, he hadn't been at school to offer a passable welcome wagon to this newcomer. Some of his friends had tried to befriend him, but without Papa Pirate there, they were, uh, would bitch made be too harsh an adjective to describe kids? <laughs> I don't think it's harsh. I think it's rather accurate. Most kids are cowards. That's how they survive to adulthood, okay? <laughs> uh, whatever terminology you find appropriate, the fact is that they weren't accustomed to fighting their own fights. Yeah, I guess that's the downside of having a bodyguard with you all the time. That's why they had a friend with seven years of pent-up aggression and a discerning eye for deserving outlets. Well, maybe today can be the day that they learn how to fight, right? Or how to lose a fight, I guess, but the more fights you lose, the better you'll get at uh, losing fights. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't have any good advice for these kids. All I know is I, I hate what I know is coming to Tiny Tim, and I hope that Papa Pirate comes around soon and rocks their shit absolutely. But today, the one day that is a free pass, yeah, it's not going to be a good day for Tiny Tim. So these friends of Papa Pirate's tried to also befriend Tim, but when the bullies came by to test the pirate free waters, they swam away to safer shoals and watched from a distance. Oh my God, dude, come on. They're bullies. You punch them once, they're gonna leave. <laughs> Eventually, Papa Pirate was released from the sick bed slash incarceration and came sailing triumphantly back like Jack Sparrow stepping off onto the docks of Port Royal. He saw Tim when he got to class, but didn't get much of a chance to talk to him before the pesky sit down and open your books thing happened. It was at recess that he was to extend Tim a firm offer of friendship. Well, thank God for that, at least. I guess the first day didn't go too bad since he came back on the second day when Papa Pirate was there, right? Am I, am I tracking with all this? There was a wee bit of an obstacle in his way, though. Of all the school's well-intentioned reprobates, there was one trio that stood apart from the rest in terms of pure assholery. Seeing as Hogan's Heroes was one of Papa's favorite shows, we shall call them Clink, Schultz, and Gruber. <laughs> Clink, of course, was the ringleader of the hooligans with a pudgy Schultz and a weaselly Gruber playing the part of his dutiful sycophants. God, Hogan's Heroes is a throwback. I don't know nothing about that. Can we cut in some Hogan's Heroes, Elijah? <laughs> it was a bright and sunny day on the playground when Papa Pirate saw Tim on the receiving end of some prepubescent cruelty. Hey, Tim, you want to go down the slide? Oh, wait, <laughs> I, I guess you can't make it up the ladder. <laughs> Schultz, hey, maybe we should carry you up and send you down. This was back when playground slides were stainless steel implements of gravity-assisted torment. On a hot day, they could be used as a makeshift griddle. Were they to send Tim down... There would be no guarantee that they would scrape him off before he would end up completely seared. Were he a steak, 
they would leave him there long enough to go from well done to fucking congratulations. <laughs> uh, oh, god damn, dude. I don't think the plastic slides are all that much better, but at least they are slightly safer. At least they won't cut your fucking face open if you accidentally bang your head while you're sliding down. Like, having lived through today's current events and whatnot, it, it's so shocking to me to see a polio kid getting made fun of. I think we are far more accepting these days, and thank God for that, honestly. The boys encircled Tim on all sides and laughed as Clink and Schultz tried to lift him from his chair. Papa Pirate walked up to them and interjected himself as the voice of reason. Papa Pirate... Can you not see what harm your words do, my brothers? Have you no pity for one less fortunate? Search your hearts for some compassion and relent. Relent, I say. Leave this boy alone and seek a kinder path in life. And by that, I mean, uh, well, he really just threw a haymaker at an unsuspecting Gruber who, not unlike the devil on a business trip down to Georgia, went down. Was it a cheap shot? Yeah. Did he deserve it? Also, yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said, now they're all going to cut and run. All you really got to do is throw one good punch. Are we allowed to put kids against the wall? <laughs> I'm just asking for a friend. That's not something that I'd actually do. <laughs> not unless it's approved. <laughs> Clink and Schultz abandoned Tim, recovered from their shock, and opted for a little two-on-one. Granted, their buddy had just volunteered for an unscheduled gravity test, so honorable roughhousing wasn't exactly in vogue. Well, Papa Pirate bowed up at Clink first, but pulled a first-rate fake out, pivoted into an oncoming Schultz. He saw Nutsing, he heard Nutsing, he knew Nutsing! Oh, it's, it's Colonel Clink, I get it. I see Nutsing! <laughs> Not about the pain he was about to receive, leastwise. Schultz was a big boy, and tall though he may be, Papa Pirate wasn't packing the kind of bicep-based firepower that one would need to land a meaningful body shot. Instead, he reset the large lad's puberty timer by dropping a field goal between his legs. You gotta do what you gotta do. In a, in a vicious street fight, <laughs> sometimes you gotta break a bottle, sometimes you gotta cut somebody's face. It's fine. A little kick in the nuts? Honestly, you're probably doing the gene pool a favor. <laughs> it was good. Papa Pirate's first rule of fisticuffs. If the fight's not fair, don't fight fair. <laughs> Schultz got sleepy and uh, had to lie down for a bit next to Gruber, who was either well and truly knocked out of the fight, or he was playing possum so as to avoid catching the advanced screening of Haymaker 2, the re-haymakerining. <laughs> this time it's personal. <laughs> uh, Papa Pirate had quickly and mercilessly leveled the playing field. Clink, backing away from his fallen comrades, with hands raised in a show of surrender. Uh, we were just having a little fun. We didn't mean any of it. We were just joking. <laughs> Papa Pirate, he's not laughing, but you were. Clink. <laughs> You're right. I, I'm sorry, Papa Pirate. Not yet, you aren't. <laughs> uh, oh my god. I love Papa Pirate, man. You seeing some kids get their ass kicked? That's beautiful, honestly. That's ambrosia. It's so good when it hits your lips. This was all happening well before school systems gave a single shit about bullying. Pah, as if they've made any improvement since then yeah true but the kids make improvements since then so i guess that's something i guess <laughs> as long as it was just words no one old enough to vote really gave a shit but once hands were thrown oh it became a different situation papa pirate says that the school didn't discriminate between instigator and defender if someone threw hands and you threw back you're both sharing the sentence clink knew this and he used it. Clink. If I don't fight back, then you're the only one getting in trouble. Papa Pirate. K. Okay. <laughs> Papa Pirate raised his fists and approached. 
Clink. Teacher! He called out for help, praying that the teacher would swoop in like a guardian angel, carrying him away to safety. His prayers were heard, but the timing of the intervention was off. The teacher ended up being more akin to a Valkyrie, carrying him to Valhalla. <laughs> Dude picking on polio kids going to Valhalla? No, that ain't gonna happen. Odin wouldn't allow it. Maybe a Valkyrie carrying him over to like the, the pit of hell. And that's hell with one L. I think that's the mythology. I'm not completely sure. <laughs> Clink, not unlike a tooth fairy after a mid-July hockey tournament, ended up with a collection of summer teeth. Some over here, some are over there. <laughs> I like how that's becoming a recurring theme. Beautiful. The teacher arrived just in time to watch Clink develop a personal connection with the holiday classic of All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth. Papa Pirate still has scars on his knuckle from where he caught an open mouth Clink square in the bicuspids. God damn, that sucks. Are those the kitty teeth? Are you gonna have to have like some heavy dental surgery? I guess it doesn't matter. You reap what you sow, it is what it is. Papa Pirate got another punch on his loyal customer card at the principal's office. The silver lining, the next fist that he threw would be free. Hey, why not just throw it at the principal? Collect right now. <laughs> uh, uh, he went back to the classroom to collect his things, which, based on how poor he says he was, I imagine to be not but a bandana tied to the end of a stick. Irish pirate out here talking about his dad's hobo bindle. <laughs> uh, not even Ramtide has a hobo bindle, but I guess it was different in the 60s, wasn't it? All you got in there is a can of baked beans <laughs> and a knife in your boot to open it. <laughs> uh, Tim waved him down before Papa Pirate could make his exit. Tiny Tim, I wanted to say thank you. Why did you do that? Papa Pirate. They were being jerks to you. Uh, I didn't like that. Tiny Tim. But you you don't even know me. Papa Pirate, extending his hand. I'm Papa Pirate. Tiny Tim. I'm, I'm Tim. Papa Pirate. Well, now I know you, Tim. If anyone messes with you before I come back, let me know. I don't think they will, though. People don't usually mess with my friends. Tiny Tim. We're friends. Papa Pirate. Yeah. That okay with you? Tiny Tim getting a little emotional. Yeah. I I've, I've never really had one before. Papa Pirate. Well, now you do. And I'll be seeing him again in about a week. He was suspended, you see. He started the fight, so as far as the school was concerned, Clink, Schultz, and Gruber were all just given slaps on the wrist. They were told to play nice and not be mean to people. Yeah, truly sage advice that they were sure to listen to. Uh, turns out they did listen, at least where Tim was concerned. Well, for that part, I am grateful. Tim doesn't deserve it any worse than he's already got it, okay? His situation already fucked up enough, all right? Miss me with all of that. Papa Pirate spent his week-long mandatory vacation cutting grass around the neighborhood and helping with a few little odd jobs to scrape some pennies together. He was productive, if nothing else. When he came back to school, he was able to talk to Tim some more and get to know some more about him. His family had come to the area because two of the nearby universities had exceptional medical programs and facilities. Tim's health was a concern, of course, and they were seeking out the best possible treatment. God damn, dude. Uh, like, I'm happy for the first part of the story, because it, it all seems to have turned out well, but you know this kid's gonna end up in a fucking iron lung, if not dead, and I'm just like, watching the train roll down the tracks and knowing that there's nothing that I can do to stop it, and already it's starting to tear me up a little bit inside. Ugh. As for school, Papa Pirate quickly figured out that Tim didn't like recess. It wasn't even because of the bullies. It was because, yeah, he had nothing to do, really. He had asked the teacher if he could just stay in the classroom and read, 
Her response to this reasonable request was, Teacher, I can't just leave a cripple in the building by himself. <laughs> uh, so smooth. So understanding, right? <laughs> God. I am glad times have changed in a lot of ways. The solution to this was simple. Papa Pirate would stay inside with him. They spent a couple of days indoors during recess before Papa Pirate realized that sitting around reading was decidedly not his idea of fun. One afternoon, he gathered up his vast fortune, totaling maybe a dollar or two, and he went downtown to buy a pack of cards and a checkerboard. For the rest of school that year, the only time Papa Pirate went outdoors for recess is if Tim was at an appointment or homesick. The two played many games of checkers and had a hundred different card games, but sometimes Tim just wanted to read. And solitaire can only sustain a young boy for so long, so eventually Papa Pirate broke down. Papa Pirate, why do you like reading so much? Tiny Tim, because I can go off on an adventure. With a really good book, you get to be the character. You can go places and see things that you just couldn't in the real world. Besides, what else am I going to do? Tim's love of books had come from his dad reading to him. That wasn't something that Papa Pirate could really relate to. His dad spent more time with his mistresses than with his kids. If he ever told Papa Pirate, I love you, it was through Morse code with a belt or a branch. <laughs> Uh, or you pull out the chancla, or you get a piece of extension cord, right? <laughs> you just got to get creative with it. Yeah, I had this part too. I don't hit my kids, but I definitely went through this as well. The idea of a caring father reading to his son was just an alien concept. And so Papa Pirate started asking follow-up questions like why and what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Through their talks, Tim explained that losing himself in a good book helped him to forget about things for a little while. He didn't have to be wheelchair-bound when a book could give him legs or wings. He was passionate about reading. In their time together, he helped Papa Pirate figure out that it wasn't that he was incapable of enjoying reading. He just hadn't been reading the right genres. Tim gave Papa Pirate a couple of books to try out, and the pint-sized prize fighter started reading right alongside his friend. Some days they would play cards or checkers. Other days they would break open some paperbacks and sit in silence to let the author's words transport them to another, less cruel world. But whether it was reading or playing games, Tim could always count on his friend to pass the time with him. Honestly, this is beautiful. Papa Pirate, he's got such a good heart, doesn't he? He's a badass, but also deep down, he's, he's, he's a softy, right? And yeah, those two would probably still be friends to this day if, if, well, there's a reason that I subtitled this story, The Tragedy of Tiny Tim. By 1964, Papa Pirate was once again spending his recesses outdoors. You see, there was no reason to stay inside anymore. Turns out, polio can paralyze more than a person's legs, and sometimes it goes for the lungs. God damn, dude. I, I called this one. I saw it. Like I said, I seen it coming from so far away, and I fucking hate a 12-year-old boy, not even a teenager, and he has to live with an iron lung. That's so fucked, man. Again, big ups to Jonas Salk. I'm so glad we don't have to worry about this anymore. Ugh. Tim wasn't part of Papa Pirate's life for very long, all things considered, but he left an indelible mark. Papa Pirate says that he never really gave up or got depressed, as far as he saw. Once he had found a friend, he met every day with a smile. More than that, he had done something that seven years of teachers couldn't. He got Papa Pirate to fall in love with books. God, I do feel tears welling up a little bit, like... I feel bad for the kid, but I also feel so grateful that Papa Pirate was there to, you know, be his friend and give him a, a that sense of hope, a reason to get up every day. And goddamn, 
I knew I knew the tears were gonna come a little bit, but yeah, it, at the end of it, it is kind of happy tears. Like at least he ha he got to have a friend, a really fucking good friend, and it wasn't just a one way street. They were good for each other. So yeah, I, I'm grateful that it happened. Sad that it had to go the way that it did, but uh, grateful that it happened. When Papa Pirate was 44, he found himself in a bit of a conundrum. His son was being bullied regularly. Oh, God. Can't go to school and beat up the 12-year-olds when you're 44. They frown upon that. <laughs> he wanted to tell young Irish Pirate to take the long trip to the principal's office. He wanted desperately to teach that young buccaneer the sweet science, the fine art of season-based dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> but Mama Pirate had been born into a life of relative privilege. The worst conflict she ever experienced in her youth was when some young hussy tried to make eyes at a bow, and she had to give her a right good telling off. <laughs> uh, Mama Pirate's advice to the boy was, Don't get in a fight no matter what. They're just words. Words can't hurt you. Uh, doesn't seem like great advice. Especially as a young man. Come on, get in a couple fights. Live your life, right? How do you know what you're really capable of if you've never been in a fight? <laughs> uh, that, that's the advice I give to my kids, honestly. <laughs> and my son, he, he's big. I don't think he's going to have to worry about bullying too much. But yes, Papa Pirate knew better. He and Mama Pirate had several heated discussions about this subject. She never relented. And so he sat back and watched his son struggle with daily bouts of verbal harassment that would bring him home in tears. Son, son, you need to punch them one time. That's all it's going to take. Kick him in the neck. Dole out some hard lessons. <laughs> uh, now, Papa Pirate's dad had never read to him, but Papa Pirate was not his dad. So he sat the young Irish pirate down one evening and tried to read to him a children's book, two children's books, a hundred children's books. He desperately wanted to give his son the kind of connection that he did not have with his dad. He wanted to teach his son a way to escape the problems that he wasn't allowed to solve. He was disheartened at the fact that his son wasn't receptive of the efforts. The boy liked spending time with him, but the books just weren't capturing his attention. He was about to give up when he thought of a book that he had been given a long time ago by a heartbroken couple who had recently bought a small pine box. This book had been Tim's favorite, and his parents wanted Papa Pirate to have it. So he sat little Irish pirate down and cleared his throat. Papa Pirate. <clears throat> in the hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. The boy didn't move. He barely breathed. He leaned against his dad, ear pressed to his chest, and listened to every breath, every word. Little Irish pirate's mind went to Middle Earth, the Lonely Mountain, and when the Battle of the Five Armies was over, Papa Pirate led him on to Moria, Rohan, Helm's Deep, and Pelennor Fields, and even to Mordor. I mean, everybody knows that you don't just walk into Mordor. <laughs> <laughs> As the years went by, the boy went on his own adventures. Hogwarts, Coruscant, Scadriel. And one day the boy decided, I want to make a world of my own. Books, fantasy specifically, helped the tormented youth escape a world that seemed to hate him. By the time he was the age that Tiny Tim had been, Irish Pirate was already world building. He was talking about how much he wanted to be an author. Papa Pirate had succeeded in giving his son a love of books, but the greater gift that he had given was one of love and support. And despite Mama Pirate's best efforts, there would come a day when Papa Pirate would sit the lad down for a new kind of lesson, one that would end this fucking torment and allow him to focus on his writing. And honestly, as soon as you get a book out, Irish Pirate, I'm hopping all over that. Let me narrate that. We going straight to Audible. I promise not to interrupt. I'll just let your writing speak for itself. 
Now, some of you came here because you saw my name pop up on the subreddit and thought, hey, Star Wars shenanigans didn't completely kill my interest in the written word. Maybe this will be kind of like that. <laughs> uh, hilarious. Others of you are here because an algorithm said, oh, hey, check this out. And still others of you are here because it's 3 a.m. and the ambient hasn't quite kicked in yet and you're so far down the YouTube or Reddit rabbit hole that the Mad Hatter is expecting you for company. It's me, I'm the Mad Hatter. Welcome to the tea party. <laughs> no matter what brought you here though, thank you for sticking through the story. I don't really know if this is cringe, I don't even know if it's a story of revenge, it's just life. Heavy, yes, but life. And personally, I think that's okay. I don't think every tale needs to have an appropriate subreddit. Some tales are just worth telling without labels. I'm just hoping that you thought that this was one of the ones that was worth listening to or reading. I promise the next Papa Pirate will have less of the boo-hoo and more of the har-har. <laughs> there once was a boy that got mad, protecting the wounded and sad. He read and he played with the friend he had made and passed the gifts on to his lad. Oh, just a little limerick at the end. That is beautiful. And I really like the way that you went out with it, Irish Pirate. You're right. You know, some stories just need to be told and... Fitting it into a subreddit does a disservice to the story. This was beautiful. I don't think I broke up as much as I did with like some of the more extended, drawn out type of stuff. But yeah, my heart does break for Tiny Tim. And even if I did see it coming, I knew that it was not going to be an easy thing to get through. And it definitely did hurt. But at the end of it all, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Drunk guys come out to play. <laughs> Warriors come out to play. The Ballad of Papa Pirate Rivalry Renewed. Oh, that's good alliteration. What is this like the brothers? They came back or something? After getting a bunch of wasps in their outhouse, they didn't remember what happened to them last time? Good. Give them some more. <laughs> they need another beatdown because they drank too much and the last one slipped out of their brains or something. So, I'm back again with another installment of The Ballad of Papa Pirate. I guess this one would fall under the category of pro-revenge, maybe? Yeah, that's what we're doing. That's where all these Papa Pirate stories are going. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, okay? Subreddit, it's all tertiary, okay? Some stories just need to be told. Like I said, whatever you want to call it, at its core, it is a red exclusive. Yes! The branding! <laughs> if you haven't listened to the other parts, I would recommend it. Original posts can be found here, or you could listen on Red X's YouTube channel instead. Yes, playlist in the description. Thank you so much. And before we get into this new story, we've got a prologue. Kate, Papa Pirate's big sister, had a bad habit of choosing even badder men for companionship. Yes, grammatically, it'd either be worse men, but I was doing a comedic bit, so shut up! <laughs> I didn't say anything about it, I'm sorry. Her little brother, tired of seeing his big sister get hurt, took it upon himself to terrorize her new suitors preemptively. I don't know if that's the way to go. Like, what if she found a good one and he was terrorized preemptively be because we presume from her track record. But yeah, you also probably don't want to wait for them to do something crappy because then, ah, it's a catch-22. At the end of the day, I say do whatever you want to do. You don't want to see her get hurt? Yeah, okay, preemptive is good. And then, that's like the litmus test, right? If they laugh it off, if they're cool about it, maybe they are good people. If they get their egos hurt, something like that, then they're they're probably bad people. So yeah, continue on, Papa Pirate. Do what you do. Only the strong would survive. Some of the more noteworthy trials included hiding a fish under one guy's passenger seat, <laughs> uh, putting petroleum jelly on the blades of another guy's windshield wipers, <laughs> chasing one through the local graveyard 
with one of the only family heirlooms to survive the Great Depression, a ceremonial Knights of Columbus sword. God, that last one seems more like a salt, doesn't it? <laughs> He's just gonna chop him up with a sword? It's gone from like funny pranks to like I'm literally gonna somebody. Okay, great. <laughs> but there was one, only one, that Papa Pirate did not terrorize. Not for lack of trying, mind you. We'll call him Matt. Why? Well, because Papa Pirate says that he looked and sounded like a precursor to Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Matt got out of his car one evening and started heading to the door to pick up Kate for a night out. He stopped when he saw something suspicious. There was a small length of rope running across the sidewalk. One end was tied securely to the porch railing and the other disappeared into a bush. Oh, Matt is observant. He, he, he doesn't have the brain of Matthew McConaughey. It's not clouded with smoke or anything like that. He's like, look at that rope on the grass there. What's going on? The rope was lax, but if the bush end somehow got pulled tight, it would make for one heck of a tripping hazard. I mean, I guess that is a prank. You need to use something thinner, you know, like a high test fishing line or something like that. <laughs> Just straight up rope? Nah, that ain't the way to go. Anyways, Matt, having heard about Kate's little brother and his penchant for mischief and overprotectiveness, made a slow approach, stopping just short of the rope. He followed it to the porch railing and inspected it. Matt, to the bush behind him, You know, this will probably work better with like a bowline or, or a slipknot. <laughs> the bush, Why's that? Matt, well, let's say I fell down. Someone would hear it and come running. This, pointing to the knot, is, well, I don't even know what kind of knot you'd call it, but it's a mess. And it would take forever to untie. No way you'd have it undone by the time someone got here. But like a slip knot or a mooring hitch, strong enough to trip a boyfriend, but easily untied with a single tug. <laughs> Matt's giving out advice on the pranks. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's got to chat Papa Pirate's ego just a little bit. And he's going to go out and show your sister a good time. Maybe he's not an <laughs> honestly. Let's hope for that. That's, that's what I'm going to go with. The bush did not reply. Matt, you're down the street with the evidence before I could even sit up if you do it right. Papa Pirate revealing himself to have been the bush all along. You're going to tell my parents. Aren't you? <laughs> Matt? No, but I'd appreciate it if you didn't try it again. Or if you do, at least do the rope work, like, better. <laughs> uh, God, that's, that's gotta hurt just a little bit. He thought he had the perfect prank. It worked on everybody else, but not this dude. Papa Pirate? How do you know so much about that? Matt? I'm an Eagle Scout. Did Papa Pirate himself ever join the Boy Scouts? No. Did he allow Matt to date his sister in exchange for the occasional bit of practical instruction? On his honor. Now, there are a number of stories I could tell about old Uncle Matt, and that number is zero. I don't even have an Uncle Matt. Whoa, mine is blown. He didn't make the cut. Who would have thought that young love doesn't last forever? <laughs> <laughs> and why do I not have an Uncle Matt? Because, like the cautious and coordinated curator of a curious collection of colon-crafted curios catering to the culinary cravings of customers characterized by <laughs> Matt had his <laughs> together. <laughs> uh, oh, the alliteration brings me so much joy. Thank you so much. And yes, because of that... There was nothing for Kate to fix. And so they were not meant to be. God, that's tragic, isn't it? <laughs> She's like, you're not damaged enough for me. Why why you need somebody that's that's damaged? There's gotta be some sort of trauma in the past that makes her pick damaged men consistently. But I hope she gets that worked out eventually. I hope you have an uncle so and so. Uncle stuff together. That's what his name is. <laughs> 
Uh, but for what it was worth, Matt and Papa Pirate had parted on good terms. He had Papa Pirate's approval, which, I mean, good for him, I guess. But if we're being honest, having the approval of an ex-girlfriend's little brother is like having the instruction book to a game whose disc that you lost long ago. I mean, you could still get some money for that on eBay, right? <laughs> some people are looking to replace their boxed instructions or whatever. You'd be surprised the kind of stuff people buy on eBay. I saw them selling just boxes for a PlayStation. I was aghast! Did you know a PlayStation box worth about like $15, $20? At least according to eBay. Whatever. Anyways, <laughs> I guess that's all the precursor out of the way. Let's go ahead, get over into the story. The year was now 1966 67. Papa Pirate had spent two summers working in the tobacco fields, squirreling away every last nickel and dime until he had enough to buy a used car from one of the men at his church. Oh, Papa Pirate ain't a baby no more. We, we had a little bit of a time skip there, didn't we? It was a rust-colored 57 Chevrolet Bel Air that had once been powder blue. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a fixer-upper. It had a couple of neat features, like the fact that you could see through some holes in the floorboard. <laughs> and that you were almost guaranteed to get a little cardio when the time came to start her up, unless you were able to park on a downhill slope, that is. <laughs> it's a beater, essentially, but hey, first car generally is, and he earned it with his own money. Just don't drive over any puddles or you will get wet. <laughs> Rolling death trap, though it might be, the rust bucket afforded Papa Pirate and his crew a means by which to head to the next town over. Uh-oh, they're mobile now! <laughs> Watch out for those rapscallions. At one time, they was just young, but now they're cruising the streets in a car looking for trouble. They used to do it on bikes. <laughs> so yes, they went to next town over USA, where things are just as crappy as they are in your town, but with a novel flair. <laughs> well, I'm sold. Let's pack up the kids. We got, <laughs> we got to go over there. I can't say that with a wholly straight face, though. I grew up in the same town that Papa Pirate did, and it wasn't until senior year of high school that we got our very own Walmart. The marching band came out to play for its opening. Yay! Late stage capitalism! Mom and pop shops are dying! Da 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 da! <laughs> uh, hooray! I really wish I was making that up. So anyways, in next town over, they had a few things in the 60s that hometown did not. Most of the kids Papa Pirate's age went there for the dance hall or the movie theater. There was also a bowling alley and a pool hall with an adjoining bar. I mean, it sounds like next town over got a leg up on hometown, right? Why doesn't hometown have any of these things? I guess <laughs> it's cheaper to live there. That's why it's hometown. And I guess we get a little, uh, a little poetry before the events truly take place. Two parties, both alike in indignity, in next town over's bar where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge renewed presently, where stiff drinks make shaky hands unclean. From four year past came these two foes, a pair of star-crossed factions threaten life. The past misdeeds from friends and bros came back once more to end in strife. Oh my God, it is the Outhouse Brothers. <laughs> this is amazing. I love it. They're not just kids anymore, okay? And old habits die hard. The Revengeancing, Rivalry Renewed Part 2, The Re-Rehappening Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> Papa Pirate was celebrating a bit of his newfound freedom with a friendly game of pool. If you've read or listened to the previous parts of the Papa Pirate Ballad, you will know two things. One, he wasn't above throwing a punch at an unsuspecting target, if they deserved it. And two, his friends had suffered for years at the hands of a pair of alcoholic brothers in hometown. Well, these two things came to a head upside Papa Pirate's head. Oh, they sucker punched him, right? 
Then you got to break a pool cue in half and run it through his gut. No, don't do that. You'll go to jail. <laughs> Just break it in half on top of his head. There you go. Tit for tat. Everything's fine. The room was set to spinning and his ears were ringing when Papa Pirate caught himself on the side of the pool table. He turned around to see the brothers with some of their friends going for an encircling movement. Oh boy. Why does this always happen at the pool bars, right? <laughs> I didn't even shark anybody. It was a friendly game of pool. Leave me alone, guys. Bro one. Well, if it isn't one of those little sh Bro two. <laughs> Looks like there's only a few of them. Where are the rest? Where were the rest? Well, back in hometown, of course. Yeah, you only got one car. You got to pick and choose who gets to go. The brothers had seen and recognized some familiar faces and led an inebriated entourage from the bar to the pool hall. Face to face with their old foes, the pair were once again picking a fight with a group of kids, and the odds were heavily in their favor. They were older, they were bigger, but more importantly than all of that, they also had the numbers. Papa Pirate didn't have his whole crew. What he did have was a rough escape that left him with a fat lip and a nasty headache. Yeah, we call that a tactical retreat, okay? <laughs> You know you're going to lose this fight. You don't have to stand and fight, all right? Get out of there. Live to fight another day. Plot your revenge. Apparently, they, they did forget. They want a little bit more smoke. So, all right, I'm going to bring them the heat. Well, so, was this to be the end of Papa Pirate's mischief? Had the time come for him to abandon his rebel ways and walk the straight and narrow path? Hell no! <laughs> <laughs> he drove back to hometown as fast as his Chevy POS would allow and visited all of the familiar haunts. The shiny diner, the piggly wiggly parking lot, back to the shiny diner. Eh, there were really only two places to spend your time in hometown if you were a teenager. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's why they gotta go visit the pool hall. I gotta be honest with you, bro. Hometown seems like it kind of sucks. <laughs> I'm going to move to the next town over USA, all right? This worked to his advantage, however, since it meant fewer stops on his recruitment drive. Papa Pirate had developed a reputation of being harsh but fair in his assignment of beatings. People would say he had a short temper and saw violence as the solution to most problems, but it was known that you had nothing to fear from him unless you were a total... So we've gone from just like friendly childhood pranks to, to outright beatings. That's not as fun. That's not as carefree. But I guess, you know, uh, people change over time. <laughs> he found out that the beatings were a lot more effective. So he's like, yeah, we're, we're just going to do that now. No plotting, no planning. You just show up and beat the hell out of him. Easy. <laughs> he was sort of like Dexter. Only instead of killing killers, he bullied bullies. God, Dexter, I really loved that show. It's just the last season that really dropped the ball. Apparently, Dexter New Blood is supposed to be pretty good. I should watch that. Maybe give it a, a bit of a redemption arc. Was that like seven intriguing seasons of Dexter? And then one episode, the ending episode, just throws it all out the window? God, I still feel like my time was wasted. I'll never get that time back. <laughs> it hurt me. It cut me deep. Anyways... This allowed him to cultivate a large collection of people that fell somewhere between acquaintance and friend. When they saw him circling their gatherings like a split-lip General Patton, they mobilized and fell in line. A line of cars that made an impromptu trip from hometown to next town over in record time. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> uh... Now who has the numbers advantage? Now who's looking real brave? Papa Pirate was half afraid that the brothers would have drunkenly stumbled off into the ether before he could return with reinforcements. But when the Legion arrived, Papa Pirate sent one in to scout to see if the enemy was still encamped behind their glasses. God, I love this. You are painting a picture so beautifully. <laughs> we are at war, boys! <laughs> the scout returned and reported that the brothers and their friends were still present and accounted for. Papa Pirate 
then began clinking empty beer bottles together and cried out, Drunk guys, come out to play! <laughs> Warriors, come out to play! Uh, the Warriors? Anyone? No? I, I picked that up immediately. Okay, so no, that part didn't actually happen. Papa Pirate walked into the bar and immediately ignored the bartender, yelling at him for being too young to come in and blah, 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 something, something. He hadn't come for the drinks unless it was to drink the blood of his enemies. <laughs> uh, oh, it's good. It's so juicy and delicious. Like the blood of my enemies. <laughs> Papa Pirate. Hey! The brothers looked as if they had been slapped. Did he just say what they thought he had said? Did this little sh really have the brass pair required to come into the den of the enemy and issue such a challenge? Papa Pirate. You wanted to start something earlier. Want to step outside now and we'll finish it. Either pride or alcohol dictated the response. The brothers did, in fact, have an interest in finishing it until they got outside and saw what it entailed, at least. <laughs> Papa Pirate had assembled no less than 20 boys from his school. Some of them had been on dates and their sweethearts were in the background giving very tepid protests. No, stop, don't. <laughs> Why women always gotta tell the man not to fight? Stay back here, sweetheart. Man, I'm gonna go cauliflower's ear. Bully! <laughs> uh, I think that's uh, a bit older than the 50s or 60s, but we're rolling with it. It's fine. Blood sport worked for the Romans. So, I mean, why fix what ain't broken, right? Right you are. These are the type of people that cannot be reasoned with. The only thing that they understand is hurt. You do bad, you hurt. You no more do bad, right? Maybe, we'll see. <laughs> Papa Pirate. Not so fun when you're outnumbered, huh? Yes, I am aware of the irony here. Papa Pirate and his pals always had the numbers advantage in the past, but they were 12 at the time, so whatever. It's justified. Yeah, I ain't asking too many questions. Justice is justice. I'm gonna take whatever comes. <laughs> The brothers were slowly edging their way back into the bar, but wouldn't you know it, some hoodlums had moved in behind them to block their way. Uh-oh, you in trouble now, boys. <laughs> Where are your friends at? I, I don't like a 20 on two beatdown. Maybe 20 on 10, I'll allow it. They're older, such and such. I think on the whole, like a 30 or 40 year old man would be able to, to handle an 18 year old. Experience comes into play, so does like bulk, you know? It's hard to tackle a dad bod if you're a little kid. So maybe 20 on 10 would be fair. Or not fair, but at least more fun. <laughs> the brothers really had initiated this violence. The truce that they had broken was almost old enough to go to kindergarten. It was only one way that this was going to be resolved. Whoop whoop! Oh, come on! Enter Johnny Law, stage left. Man, that bartender, <laughs> you know he called the police. He just didn't want one of those brothers to get put through the window or something like that. I guess he's protecting his property. I guess you should have shuffled him down the street a little bit more. Maybe into an alley where these type of things tend to happen. Anyways, a sheriff's deputy cruiser had arrived on the scene. The gangs parted to make way for a representative of the law. Matt. Hey, what, what seems to be the... He paused when he spotted Papa Pirate. Oh! It all comes back around, doesn't it? Oh, Matty boy! <laughs> Did I forget to mention that Matt had gone on to become a sheriff's deputy? No, I, I didn't forget. It was meant to be a dramatic reveal, so here it is! Ta-da! <laughs> it is super dramatic! What a reveal! Yeah, I love that. I didn't understand how Matt tied in until right now. Oh, you are a master of your craft, Irish pirate. Matt says, Papa Pirate? 
What the hell happened to your lip, kid? Papa Pirate with gritted teeth. I walked into a door. Matt looked around at the scene and put on his sleuthing hat <laughs> as he figured out what was happening. The brothers, you see, had a reputation for being belligerent with more than just kids. This was not their first time meeting that particular star-badged arbiter of justice. He had no love for them, but he still had a job to do. Matt? Yeah, well, if that's what you say happened, I mean, that's what happened. I'll just get some names and statements for patting his pockets. Oh, damn. I don't have my notebook. You guys hang tight. Matt then made his way back to the cruiser. He took a cursory glance around and stood up, shaking his head. Matt? Oh, man. I'm not sure where my head's at tonight. Probably back at the sheriff's office with my notebook. <laughs> I'm gonna go have to go get it. It'll be about 15 minutes, so no one go anywhere. And don't try to sort this out on your own. <laughs> uh, Matt knows exactly what he's doing. That's beautiful. Hey, I'm gonna give you 50 minutes to beat the shit out of these guys. <laughs> uh, what an MVP play, bro. I wish the law was still like this. Maybe if you know the sheriff, it would be like this, but I never lived in any place long enough to actually know the sheriff. And so reassurances were given by a horde of cross-fingered teenagers while the brothers and their friends watched in horror. <laughs> their terror swelled as the duly appointed enforcer of the law, the bearer of their only salvation, pulled away. And then the damnedest thing happened. The brothers and their friends suddenly came down with a case of the clumsies. Huh. They walked into so many doors. <laughs> uh, oh, some of them even fell down on the sidewalk and into the bushes. Maybe even a gutter or two. Rumor has it, some of them fell down so hard, they ended up with summer teeth. Some are over here, some are over there. <laughs> uh, oh, you're killing me. A case of the clumsies. A, a little whoopsie doodle. It happens once in a while. It's fine. Get up. You're going to be fine. <laughs> well, wouldn't you know it? By the time Matt returned, the gathering had cleared out. Huh. And after he specifically told them to hang tight. Whew, had they no manners? <laughs> uh, uh, well, he must have contented himself with thinking, well... I just let them all off with a warning. And this was well and truly the last time that the brothers would try anything with Papa Pirate or his friends. I mean, <laughs> it's like truly the definition of fuck around and find out, right? Find out they did. It was a truce. Everything was going fine, but then you let the booze get a hold of you and you just... You made some bad decisions. You walked into a few doors. You need to drink less. That's that's the secret. <laughs> yeah, gravity's tricky, isn't it? But it is not the last time that Papa Pirate would have a run-in with Matt. However, that's a tale for another time. Next, I think I'll talk about how Papa Pirate made an unceremonious departure from the North Carolina public school system. Spoiler, it involves him losing his temper on someone that deserved it. And that someone was not a student. Yeah, but I mean, they deserved it. Was gravity being a little tricky that day too? I guess we'll have to find out. There once was a boy with a car who went with his friends to a bar, got decked in the lip, then made a quick trip. What luck that his pal wore a star. Honestly, it probably could have gone a hundred different ways, but sometimes karma works in mysterious ways. The universe just aligns. So instead of being like, oh, jeepers, it's the fuzz, and then <laughs> scamper, split. <laughs> we all got to scram, skedaddle, boys. <laughs> Again, I'm doing like a 1940s gangster voice or whatever, 1920s. <laughs> but yes, it is fortuitous that Matt was the one that showed up, and uh, Matt just turned a blind eye. Oh, how unfortunate. The fortunate side is that these dudes, they definitely learned a lesson. 
That is the end all be all. Is Matt going to be a friend at the end of the day? I mean, how many times can you let Papa Pirate just slide? You know what I'm saying? Sure, we're bros, but at a certain point, I got to hold you accountable. I don't know if Matt is going to be a hero all throughout the stories, but um, I'm eager to see. Are we going to flash back to the love boat pretty soon? <laughs> it floats back to you. The Ballad of Papa Pirate of Trash Cans and Trysts. Oh, we taking a trip back to the love dumpster today. I love it. <laughs> I'm all about it. Tell me something good, Papa Pirate. Did you have fun behind the trash can at the Kmart? Did they have Kmarts back in 1960? They had to. That's before all the Kmarts got shut down, right? Oh, that's a tangent. Okay. <laughs> Come listen to my story about a man who wasn't named Jed. Although he wasn't no mountaineer, he was in fact poor. And this tale will lay the foundation of how he would one day keep his family fed. Papa Pirate loves the Beverly Hillbillies. So what kind of son would I be if I didn't inject a little bit into the intro? Oh, and then he shot at a squirrel and up came a bubbling black gold. <laughs> Texas tea. <laughs> I know something about the Beverly Hillbillies. Okay. This is to be the fourth installment of the Ballad of Papa Pirate. This is where I would normally post links to the previous installments, but given the fact that this is a red exclusive, the links would really just lead back to the same subreddit. Who actually reads these when it's easier to just wait for the video? I mean, I do notice some people cruising through the subreddit, but yeah, I think a lot of people here wait for the videos, and I am so grateful for that. <laughs> I require your views. Thank you so much. Isn't it a little presumptuous of you to think that it'll get red, Irish pirate? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm pretty partial to authors who I've interacted with before, you know? We build a bit of rapport, and then as soon as a new episode drops, I'm like, oh, I'm hungry. What's that? Mommy Honker Donkers, Irish Pirate, Gay Cop, Ram Tie? Give it to me. I'm going to read it right now. Yes, it'll get read. 100%. Look, everything I've written so far in this subreddit has ended up on the channel. Except for a story that I wrote about my sadistic wife. And if r slash I love my wife ever makes it to the rotation, well, it might still make the cut. Is that a subreddit? Oh my god, yeah. It kind of is. <laughs> it's really, really small. Uh, that's sad. R slash I love my wife is where I would go. Total wife guy energy over here, and you know what? I'm 100% about it. If being a wife guy is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> Come at me with your miserable marriages. <laughs> uh, anyways, that said, let's continue our journey through the days of yesteryear. Papa Pirate's split lip. See part three for details on that. Yeah, link is in the description. There's a playlist and everything. Thank you so much. Actually, I think it's just in the r slash pro revenge playlist, but now it's long enough, I should probably make it its own playlist. I'm just thinking out loud, whatever. <laughs> it had mostly healed by the time he started his junior year of high school. He stumbled along with the academic grace of any other standard issue hoodlum, he wasn't in danger of failing out, mind you. He just wasn't an adherent of the philosophy it pays to get A's, but C's get degrees. Honestly, not a bad philosophy. Not getting A's really messed me up. I would get a B on a paper, and I'd just feel a certain type of way about it, and that just ain't no good, you know? As somebody wiser than me once said, don't watch the numbers. <laughs> it applies to YouTube as well, okay? If I look at the analytics, I'm just going to get depressed. So let YouTube do what it do. Let high school do what it do. It's all going to turn out fine at the end. I promise you. So Papa Pirate was nearing the end of the fall semester and delaying the inevitable question of, uh, what the hell am I going to do next year? <laughs> That's what everybody says when they get out of high school. They're like, oh no, real life is going to start happening. Oh boy. So I joined the Navy because I had no idea what I was going to do next. His junior year was halfway over. He was going to be a senior next. And then what? MMA fighting wasn't really a thing yet. And boxing had too many rules. So he couldn't make a living with his most finely honed skill sets. 
This left him so preoccupied with the summer of 68 and what would lay beyond it that he had forgotten about the spring of 68, those pesky little things called the last three semesters. Yeah, but it doesn't hurt to look down the road. It doesn't hurt to freak out about things that you can't change. <laughs> Actually, it does. <laughs> In the summer of 66, a new faculty member had joined the illustrious ranks of Hometown High's top-notch educators. Uh, heavy sarcasm implied there. This man was no ordinary under-salaried public instructor. Oh no, dear readers and or listeners. This was a college professor. Or at least he had been. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure he's gonna build his whole personality around that. Great. What an interesting and complex human being. No one was quite sure how Barney fell from the graces of higher learning, but his rebound career in the humid halls of an underfunded Southern school had left him, uh, just a touch bitter. <laughs> his misery wasted no time, sending handwritten invitations to everyone in his proximity because, of course, misery loves company, after all. God, I have to wonder why he lost the college job, though. <laughs> That's just the slightest bit sus, is it not? I'm not gonna assume he's out there diddling kids or anything like that. <laughs> I would never assume something like that. I'd never say it out loud. I am sort of thinking it, though. <laughs> Some speculated that his departure from his collegiate career had something to do with an injury that he had sustained. There was no way of proving a connection, but being forced to wear a back brace that prevented him from turning his head might have played a role in his choleric temper. Maybe he just has scoliosis. A little bit of that old spina bifida, right? <laughs> uh, probably should laugh at that, but also whatever. Oh, and why are we calling him Barney? Well, because Papa Pirate described him as having Barney Fife syndrome. Oh, that, that Don Knotts syndrome, where your eyes pop out of your head. Is that what's going on here? For those of you who have never seen the Andy Griffith show, First of all, what are you doing? <laughs> Second of all, I'll assume you never spent your sick days with your grandparents. Don Knotts plays a sheriff's deputy named, you guessed it, Barney Fife. He was a small man with a small measure of authority, and he milked every last drop out of it wherever the opportunity presented itself. Not unlike the Barney of our tale. Oh, so it wasn't like a physical thing with him. I mean, seeing Don Knotts in the neck brace, that would be pretty funny, too. That would make me laugh. <laughs> Every single one of you has known somebody with Barney Fife syndrome. A shift supervisor who acts like the CEO. A mall security guard who fancies himself a food court Columbo. God, Columbo. We got so many, like, old TV show references here. Are we gonna flash back to the love boat pretty soon? <laughs> <laughs> it floats back to you. Or perhaps the little old lady who carries a copy of the Homeowners Association guidelines with her like it's the holy back flipping Bible. What's this? A departure from coarser language? Has Irish pirate rid himself of his potty mouth? No, I'm just trying to help Red stay off of Susan's radar. Oh, bless up for that, honestly. <laughs> I've been having to cut back a whole heck of a lot. Hopefully things will be turning around within a few days. I'll get my ad suitability back. They let you do like this self-certification thing if you've been being a good boy. But I haven't been being a good boy because I uploaded the incel dictionary for a little bit of background for those who are curious. Sprinkle some liberal amounts of the good king's English wherever you think it would fit. Which in the current uh, climate, yeah, that's that's nowhere for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to continue feeding my family. I appreciate it. So yes, Barney acted like any other petty tyrant. It hasn't taken the class of 68 long to form an opinion of their new math teacher. If he was a restaurant, his Yelp reviews would have driven him out of business by the time of the fall formal. He was universally reviled. He also had a weakness. Ah, uh, yes. Everybody has a weakness. Everybody. 
it's time to exploit it or just ignore him for the next three semesters and go on about your life. But I think Papa Pirate's gonna exploit it. <laughs> like all narcissists, Barney had a desperate love of flattery. The more prestigious the flatterer, the more effective the outcome. Does that work in the inverse? Hey, Barney, eat my <laughs> He's probably dead now. I'm just yelling at a skeleton at this point. <laughs> uh, and so it came to pass that the in crowd could earn a stay of execution with not but a good morning, Mr. Barney. Mm, I like your jacket. Ugh, brown nosers. <laughs> Were they still going to laugh? about the metal brace under it when his back was turned to the board? I mean, well, yeah, they were kids, so of course, you should stick some magnets to it. That is hilarious. Oldest prank in the book, but really, it, it never ages. It's amazing. <laughs> Not that I condone bullying. I'm sorry, Susan. Don't, don't ever do that. <laughs> God damn it. Uh... This put Barney in a bit of a predicament. He could hear the laughter. He knew there was some snickering going on behind him, but the flattering facade functioned as a fusion of false faces and feigned ignorance. Love that alliteration. <laughs> the brown-nosing narrative needed non-confrontation to nurture narcissistic nepotism. <laughs> I just want a whole story with nothing but alliteration like this. I would read that story every day for a year <laughs> until I know it like the back of my hand. If only there was someone that Barney could accuse without having to go through the tedious process of turning around to verify the culprit. If only there was some kid in his class that had already ended up on his bad side within the first week of the semester. Hmm, if only. <laughs> Before the frost of February had thawed, Papa Pirate had sealed his fate with a piece of chalk and a short statement. Barney had written problems on the board and asked each student to come up and attempt to complete it in front of the whole class. Each student would stand before the others like a contestant on the world's worst game show and put their arithmetic acumen, or absence thereof, on display. Yeah, I guess public shaming used to be like a lot more of a thing in the school system in the before times. I don't ever remember this happening necessarily. I'm pretty glad they, they did away with it, if I could be frank. When one of the golden children got an answer wrong, he was provided a gentle correction. When an undesirable got it wrong, they were met with the wrath of a brace-necked, algebraic Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> uh, whatever, man, you can't tell me nothing. I don't have to sit here and listen to this from a defunct college professor. Go get a real job! <laughs> I'd throw it back in his face every chance I got. Despite having developed a love of reading through his brief friendship with an ill-fated, polio-stricken young boy named Tim, English was not Papa Pirate's best subject. Math, however, came pretty easy to him. When he was called on down as the next contestant on The Price Better Be Right or So Help Me, he confidently tackled the formula. He had counted ahead to see which problem would be his and worked it out beforehand so he wouldn't be stuck scrambling for the answer under the scrutinizing gaze of a man who fancied himself the next Pythagoras. Where does that sort of ego come from? I, I guess it comes from the narcissism. Irish Pirate does have a psychology degree, so I'm really going to take his word on that. This is not one of those times that the word is thrown around like a buzzword. <laughs> uh, this dude is a narcissist. He finished his marks and turned to Barney. Papa Pirate was no sycophant. He wasn't about to kiss this man's hindquarters. Barney was a bully. And by now, we all know how Papa Pirate feels about bullies. But even a bully like Barney couldn't gaze upon Papa Pirate's calculations without saying, Barney, Rod, how could you possibly be this far off? Are you supposed to be in the slow class? <laughs> yep, good old public shaming. Even though I'm sure the answer was right. 
<laughs> With a cacophony of laughter behind him, Papa Pirate looked back at the board, thinking that he might have completed the problem wrong. But no, he had done the right problem, and he was sure that the answer was right. He turned back to Barney and saw him holding a piece of paper in place with a fingertip. It was the answer sheet. Something was off. Papa Pirate, I'm pretty sure I'm right. Barney, and I'm pretty sure you're an idiot. Papa Pirate, then what is the correct answer? <laughs> yes, please tell us all and show us your work. <laughs> uh, Barney gave the answer in a tone that dripped with condescension. Papa Pirate looked back at the board and checked his math. There was no way that answer was right. His eyes drifted down to the next question in line and made a discovery. Barney was giving the answer to the next problem. Papa Pirate shook his head and looked back at his tyrannical teacher. Papa Pirate, uh, check your sheet again. You're looking at the answer to the next question. Barney huffed and Barney puffed. Yes, how dare you correct me. I'm supposed to be the teacher. If I'm wrong, everybody just <laughs> revise your, your view of the world to make it right. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <sighs> Barney looked at the paper and he turned bright red when he realized his mistake. Barney, uh, fine. You're not as dumb as you look. You can have a seat. <laughs> Papa Pirate, okay. Right after I have an apology. Ooh, I love this. He not taking no guff. <laughs> you can't speak to me this way. I'm a human being. Yes, I'm a student. But if you'd like to help people learn, then you don't abuse them in such a fashion. Barney, excuse me? Papa Pirate, you called me an idiot and said that I look dumb, even though I was right. I deserve an apology. Barney, You'll deserve detention if you don't take your seat. God, this is one of those school things that has not changed at all. Yeah, we did away with the public shaming, but the teachers that are holier than now and think that they can't possibly correct it, they are still out in full force. <laughs> uh, God, I hope he gets what's coming to him. Please feed me that pro revenge, baby. Papa Pirate. Are you going to apologize? Barney, that's it. He shuffles back to his desk. You, you don't want to sit here. That's fine. He takes out a piece of paper and hastily scribbles on it. You can walk then. Uh, all the way to the principal's office. Wow, you're so clever with your retorts. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow for that apology. How about? <laughs> Papa Pirate took the paper and read over it. Barney was recommending that Papa Pirate be suspended for a week for being quote-unquote insolent and disrespectful. Isn't that quite ironic? <laughs> Isn't it the teacher himself who has been insolent and disrespectful? But okay, I'll take my lumps. It's my word versus this a-hole. Maybe talk to some of the other kids in the class. They would definitely back up this story if nobody likes him truly, truly. Papa Pirate had been trying to maintain a grip on his temper. As some of you who have been along for this ride know, he had a hard time maintaining an easy breezy outlook on life when he felt slighted. He balled up the paper and walked to the door. He stopped and looked back before heading out. Papa Pirate, insolent and disrespectful mean the same thing, by the way. I guess this is why you teach math. <laughs> uh, oh, I love it. You could have also thrown in at a high school level because you got kicked out of college for diddling kids and just spread that rumor. Oh, I said I wasn't going to say that. Oh, well, now it's out there. <laughs> now the rumor mill is running away with it. Varney tried to stop him from leaving. He wanted to add more to his note. Papa Pirate, however, set sail to an all-too-familiar port of call. <laughs> uh, yeah, you wanted me to go, and now you're like, wait, come back. F make up your mind. Under any other circumstances, it's likely 
that Papa Pirate would have ended up taking an unscheduled week-long vacation, Barney was looking forward to having a week without this boorish boy and his brazen bovado bungling his boisterous belittlement of all these baby bumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> the alliteration works even better in the Pearl Clutcher voice. That's beautiful. Barney didn't know that the principal was friends with Grandma Pirate. The principal read the note and asked Papa Pirate for his side of things. Principal? I see. Well, I'm going to have a talk with him this afternoon and get his side of things. I'll ask a few of the other students as well. Go home, cool off, and relax. Chill. Come to my office tomorrow morning, and I'll let you know if you're going home or to homeroom. And thus it was said, and thus it was done. Well, it's kind of nice you got to take the rest of the day off without really getting into trouble, because you know the truth is going to come out in the wash. Papa Pirate had come back the next morning to find that his story had been corroborated by some students that the principal knew would be unbiased. Barney had been reprimanded, but... Papa Pirate was cautioned to steer clear of any further confrontation with him. Barney had marked him as undesirable number one. All right, bring it. Barney can't run off to Daddy Principal in order to fix his problems. It's you and me, mano e mano, or disgraced college professor e uh, <laughs> unwilling student, I guess. And then came the fateful day. The last day. The last straw. Barney had his ironclad back to class while writing some of the problems on his board and trying to give the best instruction that he could without having to turn all the way around. To his credit, it apparently was rather difficult for him to try and write and talk to the class at the same time. So, while the cat was looking away, the mice, uh, completed the idiom. <laughs> the popular kids were laughing and chatting amongst themselves. The novelty of poking fun at Barney's back brace was long gone, but teenagers can always lean on a bit of gossip when the classroom gets too quiet. Barney, if I'm a pirate, I'm gonna need you to keep your mouth shut while we're in class, unless I call on you. Bro, why you always, you think you know my voice that well? <laughs> <laughs> Have you been watching Red X videos? If that's the case, then you do. But also, please don't watch any more Red X videos. We don't need you, Barney! <laughs> Papa Pirate, who had been busy minding his own business and inventing football plays in the back of his notebook. What? Me? Barney, still looking at the board. Is there another Papa Pirate in here? Papa Pirate, I wasn't saying anything. Barney, uh, don't raise your voice at me, boy. Now be quiet. <laughs> Bro, why you gotta address me directly? Why can't you address the class as a whole? Am I suddenly the representative of this entire class? Am I uh, being paid to keep them in line? No, that's your job. You better be careful or you get knocked down to elementary school. God, I got so many lines I want to use against them, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> this is also why I wasn't very popular with teachers in school. The popular kids did quiet down a bit. Papa Pirate glared at them. A couple of the boys made rude gestures to him and laughed at how red his face was getting. The laughter had been loud enough to draw some more attention. Barney? Uh, Papa Pirate, are you deaf? Papa Pirate, are you? Or can you just not count? You're the math teacher. How many voices do you hear talking and laughing? If it's more than one, then it's not me. <laughs> uh, he's blunt, but he's got a point. <laughs> Barney threw his chalk to the ground and turned around so fast that Papa Pirate swears he could hear the metal plates grinding against each other. Barney, you would not talk to me like that in my classroom. What, did you build it? This ain't your classroom. They're lending it to you. Until you get knocked down to elementary school. <laughs> Papa Pirate stood from his desk. In the immortal words of Don McLean, his hands were clenched in fists of rage. Yeah, American Pie, that's what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> Papa Pirate's default setting had long been to offer a change of venue when verbal resolution proved impossible, but this was a teacher. He couldn't invite him to take this matter outside, no matter how much he wanted to. Papa Pirate knew better than to familiarize this man with the concept of summer teeth. But who said that he had to take it outside? I mean, there was a place inside the school building that would be appropriate. Papa Pirate, how about the principal's office then? Barney, fuming mad at the audacity. <laughs> All right, let's go then. <laughs> <laughs> the principal, once again, is going to side with Papa Pirate. And thank God for that, honestly. I've seen principals who uh, were just completely there to protect the teacher. This principal, unbiased, there to protect the kids. A lot of things have changed about school, but yeah, that's something that they need to bring back, if it was ever a popular concept in the first place. Papa Pirate then did something. The first time he told me this story... I laughed, but I thought it was just a fanciful tale. I didn't think that he would actually have done something like this. When I first met Papa Pirate, he had learned some anger management skills. This just didn't seem like the sort of action that a calm and kind man like him would take. It wasn't until high school myself, where I met one of his old friends at a football game, that I came to believe it. Papa Pirate? Irish Pirate, this is Glenn. He was one of my best friends when I was your age. Irish pirate? Really? Glenn? Yeah, me and your dad go way back. <laughs> we got in a lot of trouble together. Irish pirate? Yeah, like his trash can incident or something? Glenn? Oh man, I, I had almost forgotten about that. <laughs> As this grown man doubled over in laughter, I looked at my impishly smirking father and thought, Oh my god. The trash can incident was real. What's the trash can incident? Please elucidate. I need more information. I want to be privy to the joke too. <laughs> what was the trash can incident? You might be wondering. Yeah, I was. <laughs> it was the incident in which Papa Pirate picked Barney up, placed him in a large wheeled trash can, and despite his teacher's protests, pushed him through the halls to the principal's office. <laughs> uh, oh my god. <laughs> you definitely going to get suspended for it, but I think it's worth it. <laughs> uh, wowzers, dude. Glenn apparently had heard Barney screaming and ran out of his classroom to see what was happening. He and, like, every other student in the school, that is. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. It's glorious. <laughs> there was no prank. There was no forethought, really. Just, like, the dude's trash. Stick him in a trash can. <laughs> uh, the principal stood from his desk with a startled expression as Papa Pirate pushed Barney in the bin through the doors. <laughs> uh, principal? Papa Pirate, what are you doing? <laughs> Barney? He did this to me. He put me in the can, and he pushed me through the whole damn school. <laughs> I mean, honestly, he probably should have taken him for, like, a lap. You know, just go meandering around the school. Make sure the kids out on the football field see what's happening. <laughs> you don't want anybody to miss this. It's going to be the talk of the town for a minute. <laughs> and Papa Pirate had, in fact, taken the longest route possible to prolong the humiliation. <laughs> uh, I love it so much, honestly. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> the principal looked at Papa Pirate in disbelief. Or strained belief, maybe. Hard to disbelieve something that you are seeing with your very own eyeballs. I mean, Papa Pirate couldn't deny that he had done it. Nor would he. 
Barney. The boy's a menace, and he needs to go. I want him expelled, Papa Pirate to the principal. Don't bother, I quit. And just like that, Papa Pirate became a high school dropout. Yeah, and a living legend. <laughs> <laughs> God, I mean, go out, get your GED, it's fine. You made the right choice here. You shouldn't be subjected to this every single day. The dude is out for blood. <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't realize what Papa Pirate was actually capable of. You should have gone and asked those two drunk brothers. Or maybe you can't ask them because they got their jaws wired shut. Summer teeth. Summer here, summer over there. <laughs> <laughs> As the rest of his friends graduated, Papa Pirate was celebrating his one year anniversary of working at the same cotton mill as his dad. It was unskilled labor, which was the only kind of job that he could get now, but that wouldn't always be the case. 100% on that, high school dropout isn't the end of the world. I dropped out of high school, bet you didn't know that. <laughs> Got my GED, did a semester of college, dropped out of college. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's fine. Life moves forward no matter what. You don't need that. Don't sit there and, and subject yourself to that. By the fall of 1968, something happened that would forever change the course of Papa Pirate's life. A young woman had just been forced to move halfway across the state when her dad retired from the Navy and got a job in next town over. She would have to finish her last three years of school far away from the beach town that she had called home for 16 years. Well, that's rough, but also look on the bright side. Fresh start, right? Her brother had a much easier time fitting in than she did. It didn't hurt that he was a phenomenal football player. He was good enough to upset the pecking order and move straight to star quarterback before his family had even finished unboxing their belongings. I'm sure old star quarterback was really salty about that. Always keep your head on a swivel. There's always a bigger fish. <laughs> Mama Pirate had made a few friends by the time she followed along to watch her big brother play in the big rivalry game between Next Town Over and their old nemesis, Hometown. Mama Pirate and her friend Jesse were finishing a transaction at the concession stand when something caught her eye. Or someone. I wonder who it was. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly Papa Pirate, considering her name is Mama Pirate. There, against the chain link fence, was an older boy in an olive drab field jacket. He was tall, lean, and according to her, the handsomest boy that Mama Pirate had ever seen. Aw, that's so nice. I hope my wife says that about me, even if it's a lie. Just say that, please. <laughs> Papa Pirate was no longer a student, but he did come out for the football games in hometown. There was precious little else to do in this glorified truck stop, after all. Mama Pirate. Oh my god, Jesse. Who's that? Jesse. No, him. That That's Papa Pirate. Mama. Do you know him? Jesse. Only by reputation. I'd steer clear of him if I were you. He's the meanest boy in all of hometown. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not. He's a living legend. Are you kidding me? That wasn't a mean thing to do. That was righteous. <laughs> that was justice. What she neglected to tell Mama Pirate is that she had once made her interests in Papa Pirate known. Had texting been a thing back then, her heartfelt confession would have been met with a single grayed out word. Scene. <laughs> bro, you got left all red, bro. <laughs> but like IRL. <laughs> Mama Pirate did not heed Jesse's advice, obviously. And that was a good thing as well, or you wouldn't be reading or listening to this. I mean, like, I literally would not be here. I guess the latter of those two points would be the more pressing, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, not existing, it seems like a bummer. But also you don't have anything to worry about. What do you mean I don't gotta pay rent no more? Wow, not existing is seeming better all the time. <laughs> no more bills. Wow. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> Papa Pirate and Mama Pirate had their first meeting. This was the story that was told to me time and time again throughout the years. 
And Papa Pirate's side of it used to sell me on the notion that when you meet the one, you'll know. I mean, I believe that notion. They talked at length that night and on the phone the next day and every day for a few days and at the movies and at the shiny diner and they were definitely high school sweethearts or rather high schooler and high school dropout sweethearts. Yeah, it counts. That's fine. <laughs> and of course that was a problem. Grandpappy Pirate and Granny Pirate liked Papa Pirate a lot. They thought he was a respectful young man, and they had no qualms with him courting their daughter. Granny Pirate had even dropped some hints about just how amenable they would be to Papa Pirate putting a ring on it someday in the future. Things were getting remarkably serious as Mama Pirate was heading into her junior year. Ah, that's another thing that's changed, man. A junior in high school talking about marriage? <laughs> Uh, and then having that marriage work out. Oh, bro, this this almost unheard of. <laughs> What's going on here? Papa Pirate was at work in the cotton mill one day when he had a glimpse of the future. A future that would be waiting for him right around the corner if he didn't change something. He saw the men and women at the cotton mill. They ranged in age from teen to geriatric. They worked hard for meager wages until their bodies inevitably gave out. He had grown up in a house with that kind of income, and he had hated growing up in a house with that kind of income. It had been the source of bitterness and anger for years. It hardened him, and not in the fun way. And, <laughs> and it had given him the shortest of tempers. And if he took Mama Pirate as his wife, he would only be setting his children up for an unfortunate sequel. Yeah, I, I know what being lower class is like. That's why I scrape and scramble so hard to try and get on top with this whole YouTube thing. Dear Jesus, I've seen what you've done for other people, and I want that for me. <laughs> uh, you know that meme? God, that's hilarious. <laughs> he quit that day and walked back to the school, straight to the principal's office. He apologized for the way he had dropped out and begged to be allowed back. See, he knew that the only way he could provide a better future for his children was to swallow his pride for once and just finish it out. And that is a really big thing to do. Again, Papa Pirate just out here doing the most. This young and already you're having visions of the future? I didn't even think about what my future would hold until I was like 25 at least. Only then did I even start trying. God. The principal helped him re-enroll under the condition that Papa Pirate takes school more seriously this time. And not to get into any fights with his new math teacher. Barney, you see, had been let go. Gosh, I wonder why. <laughs> I don't know where he ended up next, but one can only hope that he left his garbage attitude in his temporary chariot. He ended up at elementary school, and he made those kids' lives miserable. I'm like 90% sure about that. Getting knocked down the ranks, but at least these kids aren't big enough to put him into a trash can. At least not yet. True to his word, Papa Pirate buckled down on his studies. He had to repeat his junior year. Apparently dropping out prevented him from being able to count the first semester or something like that. But this wasn't a bad thing. His grades were significantly better. He was motivated to do well now. He wasn't sure what he would do for a living, but Mama Pirate had inspired him to be the very best. Like no one ever was. Bam, ba, na, na, na. <laughs> To get straight A's was his quest. To graduate his cause. Papa Pirate, puppy love is real. You guys are gonna get married and stuff. <laughs> and it actually lasted is the craziest part to me. But the truth is a, a good woman can make a man turn everything around. Why am I here? Why am I still doing this? <laughs> How did I make it on YouTube? Wifey was there. She encouraged me. She saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And now Mama Pirate has made Papa Pirate believe in that as well. It's a beautiful thing. His grades over those last two years were so good, in fact, 
that he was offered something in the spring of 1970 that he had never even dreamed of. A full academic scholarship to West Carolina University. Question. Was that one of the top schools in the state? Answer. Five minutes of laughter. I mean, I could do it, but I don't want to put you guys through that. <laughs> so we're just going to say, uh, no. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Question. Was it conveniently located? Answer. If you consider nestled in a valley only accessible via terrifyingly steep and curvy roads, a handful of miles from the river where they filmed Deliverance convenient, then, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Question. Uh, did they at least have a good football team? Answer. I ended up going to WCU myself, and we had a saying. The catamounts can smell fear. Unfortunately, uh, it's their own. If it did have one major selling point, however, um, it was going to be free. Yeah, good enough for me. I'm sold. <laughs> I'm gonna go there and put my all into it. Never look a gift horse in the mouth. I don't care if it's the crappiest college in the country. I'm gonna get a degree, right? Great. Mama Pirate was excited for him. She had no interest in college herself, but... She was willing to work to support him while he went to school. She was going to get a job and send gas money for trips home on the weekend while he was getting his degree. She would start setting money aside for them to build a house when he graduated and when they got married. There was nothing in the world that she wanted more than him. Oh, that just gives me butterflies, man. I love that so much. You guys are really working together as a team here and you love to see it. The part that brings my heart right back down is the bit about building a house on one person's income, however. Can you imagine that nowadays? <laughs> uh, that is where the five minutes of laughter should go. <laughs> uh, so Papa Pirate filled out the acceptance paperwork, got all the documents together that he needed, packed everything into a manila envelope, and took it to the mailbox. There was something in there already, though. It was addressed to him. He picked it up and gave it a read, and his heart dropped. If he sent his paperwork in a month sooner, maybe even a week sooner, the next four years of his life could have been very different. Mama Pirate wasn't the only one that wanted him. You see, Uncle Sam had written him a love letter. Oh, not Uncle Sam! Not again! <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess we know where he's going next. When you get drafted, when you get drafted! There once was a teacher so mean, his students rebelled when unseen. He picked the wrong prey and got wheeled away, lost his job, and was ne'er again seen. A young rebel once met a lass, whose bro gave the pigskin a pass. A plan was then made, but soon got delayed when the army called dibs on his ass. <laughs> Uh, so I guess the question is, does Papa Pirate step up and allow himself to get drafted? Does he run away to Canada? Does he claim to have shin splints? <laughs> uh, I think he does actually go. He seems like the type that just would take it on the chin and be like, okay, well, this is my duty and I must do it. And yeah, maybe the college plans got deferred. Maybe he never goes back to college, but Mama Pirate is the one thing that I'm sure he's holding on to. I'm sure she's willing to work a job, and hey, uh, the army will pay you. You guys could get the house built. Just make sure that you survive your tour of duty. If things get dangerous, go hide somewhere, okay? <laughs> you ain't gonna catch me out here shooting at another human being just because some oligarch told me to, okay? The Ballad of Papa Pirate! Computers, concussions, and confessions. Oh, I've experienced all of those things. One is massively the favorite over the other two, and I'll leave you to guess which one that is. You probably know if you've been hanging around for a while, right? <laughs> Here is our intensively inventive and ideally inspiring intro. Oh, snap! We got more of that alliteration coming through. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. Ah, oh, feed it to me. Aloha, as Mia More's ancestors say. Attend this aspiring author's artistic account of an admirable man's adventures. 
Ah, alliteration. <laughs> uh, it really is my favorite part. Am I attempting to attract the affection of our auditory artist for affording me access to an audience for my asides? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> like I say, man, my platform is your platform. You keep this up, I, I don't know why you're not writing books. This would be beautiful. Even a short story, 10 pages. I know you could do it and I would consume it. I will narrate it for Audible. Please, please, let's make it happen. Albeit beautiful to behold, Building this biography on the basis of words beginnings would burden this boisterous bard and might bewilder the beholders, barring them from appreciating the ballad of bygone era badassery, bubbling to the brim with battles and beatings and bravado. <laughs> uh, oh my god. I don't know how you do this, dude. You just go through like a dictionary and pluck words, but they all fit. I'm just fascinated. See, there's some alliteration too, <laughs> but we're jumping to the Fs. Conveyance constrained by such convention could come across as cumbersome, but it's certainly a cheeky and challenging choice. <laughs> this doesn't denote dereliction of duty, so don't despair. Detour around my devilish deviation for details about dad's dastardly devious and defensive deeds. Today's entertaining exposition explains exploitments of enlistment, engineering, education, and exploitation. <laughs> Forewarning though, forget foul mouth familial folklore, family friendly fun for the future. <laughs> That's what we aspire to. Everything on this channel is super family friendly. That's not true. Don't believe him. <laughs> The gregarious gentleman who graces the groundlings with his gift of gab regularly regales the general public to generate gold or at least silver or at least bronze, maybe copper. <laughs> Going against the profane grain guards him from YouTube's oligarchical gargoyle. Yes, she who shall not be named. <laughs> <laughs> Helping our host hold his habitat unhindered is only half of it, though. I inadvertently invited an individual to inspect the tales of indignity and ingenuity I've given in intermittent installments, who joined the joyful jury to judge my jargon, the kindliest of my kinfolk. <laughs> uh, this is just so off the chain, man. Can we just have a whole story like this? I'm living for it. <laughs> the kindliest of my kinfolk who could still kick her kid in the keister, Kanga to my rue, lost? Lamenting the language limit this literary limbo has leveled at my onlookers, Mama Pirate, my matron, now marks my musings to monitor my mischief. Oh, so that's why we gotta clean up the, the language, because Mama Pirate don't like the bad words. Well, she's probably not gonna like any other series on the channel, honestly. I apologize for that, I just am who I am. Got that Salem mouth, I don't know what you want. Nonsense, needlessly neutering your normal narrative to not offend a Nana? Obviously, only an oafish orangutan would outline the obligation otherwise. <laughs> uh, oh my God, dude. It's just, it's the best. The first time I saw it, beautiful. The second time around, I still enjoy it just as much. <laughs> I don't know if it would work for a whole story, but. As an intro, it's it's just mwah, chef's kiss. Pontification aside, today's presentation of Papa Pirate portrays a pinch of peril and a proper portion of pugilistic punishment leveled at a pitiful punk. Yeah, he's still got to do some punching, you know? That's kind of what Papa Pirates do. They go out there and they punch. I'm trying to do the alliteration too. It's not going as well. <laughs> Quit qualifying your quirky and quixotic quips, you quack. Really? Rather rude to reprimand a rapscallion for trying to regale the readers by resourcefully reordering the words in his red exclusive report. Oh, and he even threw the branding in there. My God. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the best. I just want to see it all the way to A to Z. Uh, asides aside, I will set the stage for today's story of shenanigans. Our tale will take us back in time to 1970, but ultimately this undertaking will usher us towards 1974. Our venerable veterans will verify that Vietnam was a venue for violence. Uh, yeah, and a lot of other stuff too. 
I never would have wanted to go. Honestly, I probably would have ran away to Canada. I'll, jo I'll join the military, but I'll do it on my terms. I want to stay on the ship way out in the water. <laughs> Just dropping a bomb on somebody from like 2,000 miles out. That's, that's more my speed. Get in their boots on the ground with a gun. Forget about it. No, thank you. <laughs> Woeful was once wide-eyed Papa Pirate that the window to the west was walled off. Exposure to extermination hadn't been expected, but an exit to Mexico and subsequent expatriation would be a vexing prospect. So, yesteryear's youthful hero was yoked with zero zeal. <laughs> yeah, you could go to Mexico. I, again, I say probably Canada's the better choice, but you do you, you know? Maybe you go develop some, some shin splints or something like that. <laughs> Conscientious objector status. I don't know. I just know of all the wars... Yeah, not Vietnam, please. <laughs> ah, but can descriptive exploits from grand heroes issuing justified knockouts logically meet numerous observers' ponderous queries? Recent story themes utilized violence. Why? Explain yourselves. Zounds! There was an A to Z right there. Every letter of that sentence or couple of sentences started with, oh my God, sequential alphabetizing? <laughs> Uh, Irish pirate never ceases to amaze me, dude. Again, I say, why are you not writing? This is truly your calling, okay? If I can help to get you there, just let me know. All right, we'll work on it together. <laughs> I'm sure you're great at, 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 you know, psychology and stuff, but this, this deserves to be shared with the world. So uh, I'm going to do my best to try and do that. Thank you for coming to help me to do that. <laughs> and now that I've made my brain hurt, I'm going to go back to my normal style. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a long time to go with that, dude. I'm, I'm super shocked. If you skipped over the shenanigans above, you might have made the right choice. No, no, you didn't. Go back and watch it right now. Rewatch it. It's so good. <laughs> you didn't miss much. Except the fact that I'm toning down my language from here on because my mom has started watching these. It's not that I'm afraid of her taking a switch to my hindquarters for using bad words. It's because I want to make it easier for my mama to listen along without getting upset. Okay then, I'll try not to interject with any bad words. We gotta unload it all right here, right now. <laughs> Again, we did the same joke in the last episode. Well, it's that and that a willowy branch has the same effect on a 37 year old's meaty mud flaps as it does on a wee lad's. Yeah, you just need like a little bit bigger of a branch, you see? <laughs> anyway, where last we left Papa Pirate, he was holding his draft notice in one hand and a college application packet in the other. Oof. The one rendered the other as useless as Valentine's Day dinner reservations to a neckbeard. Aww. Why'd he make the reservations if nobody agreed to go with him? <laughs> he just thought his melading was that strong, I guess. If Papa Pirate was to safeguard his ability to provide Mama Pirate with an ongoing supply of mid-February roses and chocolates, he would have to make some quick decisions. The army's mm, cordial invitation to get shot at had a two-week deadline. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, sign me up. I, I, I couldn't do it, man. I couldn't do it. Unless he fled the country, faked his death, or suddenly came down with a bad face of clubbed feet, Papa Pirate had a fortnight to present himself to an enlistment site. Yeah, fleeing the country sounded better and better. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm serious. People say thank you for your service and all that stuff, and I'm like, yeah, no problem. Just doing what I do, etc. But let's be honest, I spent four years on shore duty in Japan. I spent six months on a boat out of that four years. I never saw combat, nor do I really want to. <laughs> I was a postal clerk, for God's sake. I'm just not the fighting sort. But somehow, I think 1970 was a different time. Somehow, I think it would be massively frowned upon. Somehow, I think Papa Pirate is going to find it in himself to show up at that enlistment site. And that is terrifying to me. Have you ever lied to someone about having a significant other to shut down unwanted advances? 
Ever tell someone that you have a funeral to attend to avoid coming over to their house because the whole place reeks of cat pee and they're unironically dressing their felines in formal attire in order to get them married? Did you ever tell a direct TV salesman that you're already a subscriber to shut them up? I've done at least one of those, yes. Usually I, I just tell people the truth. Don't want to come over to somebody's house? I'll tell you that. Unwanted advances? I'll tell you that. Direct TV salesman? Yeah, I'll lie to you. I don't respect you enough to tell you the truth. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> what if you shoved into their hands a marriage license, obituary, or monthly bill with Sonic the Hedgehog 2 rented 16 times on pay-per-view when you know for a fact that you didn't watch it? only to recall your wife asking you a month ago to put a pin on the account because your four-year-old has figured out how to work a TV controller, but you forget to do it because you've been busy playing Yeehaw Pew Pew 2 with your buddies every night since then. It would never happen. Honestly, I lock the TV controllers up at night. <laughs> TV doesn't come on until late in the afternoon. I know exactly what's going on in my house. Yeah, I kind of rule with an iron fist, but you know what? Kids need that. They're on a schedule now. It's real nice. Uh, so where was I going with that? Oh, right. <laughs> Papa Pirate came to the enlistment office with a letter that said, Hey, dummies, we already called dibs on this guy so you can kick rocks, you know, on the ground where you do all your work because, because you're dummies. Sincerely, the way better than you, Air Force. <laughs> Uh, oh, the old chair force, but really, yeah, that sounds a, a whole lot better than running around with a rifle, doesn't it? Air Force was my first choice, you know, I nailed the ASVAB, they just didn't seem excited enough to have me, so I went Navy, and if the Navy wasn't excited to have me, well, I guess I wouldn't have joined the military at all. <laughs> Whatever. Now, before any of you Army guys come after me, remember that this was the Air Force's words not mine and before any air force dudes come after me uh, i guess get a real job <laughs> probably shouldn't say that uh, i'm just kidding air force you know i love you now give me the key to your fancy hotel room while i'm out here staying in army barracks <laughs> that really happened i was staying in barracks on north carolina air force folks they got a hotel are you kidding me god damn <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm not too salty about that. Maybe just a little bit. But yeah, I guess that was a harsh exaggeration. But the core concept of that letter was true. Papa Pirate signed on with the Air Force the day after getting his draft notice. So long as he was already enlisted in the military, he couldn't be forced into another branch. Oh, that's big brain time. Honestly, that's probably easier than fleeing the country and all that. Do you get to come back to the country once the war is over? I never really uh, understood how all that works. Now I'm too old. They ain't ever going to draft me. I don't got to worry about it, I guess. <laughs> so why the Air Force? Did he have a burning desire to become an aviator? Did he want to adopt Ride of the Valkyries or Off We Go Into the Wild Blue Yonder as his personal anthems? Well, no. He just wasn't a fan of getting shot at. <laughs> Few are. He'd had his fill of that growing up, being used for target practice by a pair of BB gun wielding alcoholic brothers. Well, those brothers were dealt with succinctly, but somehow I think that the Viet Cong won't be so easily dealt with. <laughs> uh, as America is soon to learn. <laughs> uh, what if his then comrades hadn't been so lucky? He had a friend who had been there for the outhouse attacks, the days of Tiny Tim, the next town over Rumble, and the legendary trash can incident. He had been drafted into the army and hadn't made it back out. Ow, dude. Wow. That sucks. Papa Pirate's name came up in one of the earliest rounds of draft notices. Some of his other friends had already enlisted in the Air Force as a means of getting away from hometown and doing something with their lives other than farming or laboring at a cotton mill. They encouraged him to follow their example, and it is a good thing that they did. I mean, you might not end up at the same duty station, but yeah, Air Force is the cushiest military job that there is, okay? 
you made the right choice here as far as I'm concerned. What happened next isn't as action-packed and exciting as the earlier installments, I'll be honest. I could come up with some exciting fiction about fisticuffs and hijinks, but that's not really what this is about. This is just an ongoing story about my dad and all the stuff that he told me about his life that I thought was cool or funny enough to put into writing. I mean, I'm all up for imaginary fisticuffs and hijinks, but you do this the way you gotta do it, all right? <laughs> anyway, a week before I wrote this, I asked him, OP, so was there anyone you had to get even with when you were in the Air Force? Anybody you had to give summer teeth? I then had to explain the phrase summer teeth. Some are over here, some are over there. He chuckled and said, Papa Pirate, <laughs> No, I kept my head down, minded my own business, and got the hell out. That's not to say that he didn't have any fun stories, mind you. They just weren't very revengey. And I guess that's okay. We've had plenty of revenge in this series so far. To be fair, I've got some military stories that are full of full of hijinks. Not revengey, just just hijinks. What else do you do to occupy yourself? <laughs> I guess we'll see how it goes. Part one, the Boot Camp Chronicles. Oh, good times. Good times. Papa Pirate distinctly remembers the first time his barracks was called to attention by their military training instructor, MTI, a man whose stature would give height cells a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Cause he's short. But as they say, furious foul mouth balls of hatred come in small packages. Yeah, he's out here with something to prove for sure. <laughs> he can't remember the specifics of the introductory tirade, but apparently Gunnery Sergeant Hartman wasn't the only Vietnam era drill instructor to use racial slurs and profanity as seasoning for his oratory offerings. I mean, that's, that's most of boot camp. Whatever they can mock you for, they're gonna mock you for it. <laughs> oh, and, and threats of violence, of course. You, you can't forget those. Apparently one brave soul in Papa Pirate's new band of brothers had either courage or stupidity enough to say, Cadet, the recruiting officer said you guys can't hit us anymore. Not since Korea. <laughs> uh, oh boy. Uh, you just you just put yourself on a platter, bro. Keep your friggin' mouth shut. That's like rule one. <laughs> blend, blend in as best you can. It's the only way you'll make it. Uh, military training instructor. I bet you he told you that you'll be stationed in Hawaii too. Cadet. Actually, he said it would be whatever scenic location the cadet had in mind. The world will never know. He caught a tiny fist to the stomach and started making out with the linoleum. Military training instructor. Well, they lied, boy. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it's a different time. I didn't see anybody get punched when I was in boot camp. That's fair. But we definitely got smoked a whole lot. We got smoked until the room started sweating. There was water coming down from the ceilings is how hot it got in there. Honestly, thinking back on that, I probably would have preferred to just get punched in the stomach and get it over with. <laughs> Papa Pirate says he can't even remember if that guy finished boot camp. Bet he didn't. <laughs> It wasn't the sharpest light bulb in the drawer. When they were on a marching drill, the poor guy kept losing his step. The rest of the platoon, or whatever, allowed their footfalls to be guided by the Grammy Award winning single, I left my wife with 24 children in starving conditions without any gingerbread. Did I do right? 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 Poor cadet. <laughs> he was following along to the tune of Entry of the Gladiators. MTI, after stopping the march, Cadet, why the fork do you keep losing step? Cadet, sir, I'm sorry, sir. I keep getting my right and left mixed up. <laughs> God, dude. <laughs> uh, yep, he's he's our private pile, isn't he? You're either going to smarten up or you're going to leave this place very, very strong. <laughs> or quit. I, I think he quit. MTI, oh, I'm sorry. Here, let me help you figure it out. MTI stepped closer and slammed the heel of his size 7 combat boot down on the cadet's left foot. Cadet cried out in pain as MTI wagged the finger in his face. MTI, for the rest of the day, your left is the one that hurts. 
<laughs> I mean, I would have told him to hold his hands up and the one that makes the L is your left, but you do you, I guess. <laughs> Yay, physical abuse. <laughs> the, po <laughs> the poor guy also ended up misplacing his cap a week or so later. Oh God, <laughs> he's a mess. Papa Pirate tried to help him find it and didn't make it back to the foot of his own bed fast enough and thus earned an equal share in Cadet's punishment of sweeping the sun off the roof. <laughs> oh, it's classic. I'll let you use your imagination to see if you can figure out what that entails. Honestly, I know, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a, it's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Welcome back. What did you come up with? Pause for answers, a la Blue's Clues. Did you come up with anything? Huh? Well, that's right. It's walking around on the mess hall's hot tin roof until sundown with a splintery wood-handled broom. That's exactly what I meant. Great job. <laughs> yeah, no sunscreen, no nothing. Like I said, you're gonna get real tough, real strong, real fast. This wasn't the only time he would find himself on the receiving end of a creative punishment, but there was really only one incident that he can remember more vividly. Apparently, foot lockers are supposed to stay like, you know, locked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how about it? That was part of the daily inspection. Papa Pirate was always careful to have the corners of his bed neatly made. The buttons of his shirt and the seam of his pants always neatly aligned. The footlocker in which he kept his personal effects was always locked until the one time that it wasn't. And that's always a drill instructor's favorite time because then they get to dump your stuff everywhere, right? And that's really going easy. I wonder what the creative punishment he's going to come up with is. MTI, Papa Pirate, why the fork is your footlocker unsecured? Papa Pirate, sir. I have no excuse, sir. MTI picked the locker up, carried it to the window. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought it meant like dump it all over the, the floor of the bay, but out the window, that's good too. <laughs> I should point out at this point that Papa Pirate's room wasn't on the ground floor. MTI, well, thank you for that. To make sure that this doesn't happen again, I got a little job for you. MTI upended the footlocker, spilling all of its contents to the ground below. Papa Pirate groaned internally as his worldly possessions validated Sir Isaac Newton's speculations. <laughs> MTI, now I want you to go down there, gather your things, bring them up one piece at a time, and put them back in your locker. <laughs> uh, oh man, he is creative, isn't he? If you forget to secure it before you head back down, you'll be starting all over again. <laughs> uh, it sounds worse than sweeping the sun off the roof, honestly. Walking up and down the stairs. I gotta go get my toothbrush, go upstairs. Go downstairs, get the toothpaste, go upstairs. <laughs> oh my god, dude. This little guy is just so full of hate, isn't he? The task would take him the entire day. You see, one of the items in his locker was a pickle jar filled with loose change. MTI made it clear that he regarded each coin and shard of glass as one item. You know what? I think I'm good, bro. <laughs> I think you could just have it. Leave it down there. <laughs> this is such madness. By the time Papa Pirate was done, he had made a solemn vow to himself. Taking inspiration from Scarlet O'Hara, he declared with firm confidence, As God is my witness, I will never leave anything unlocked again. <laughs> I mean, it did its job. It helped you to learn. Yeah, it made for a hell of a day. Impromptu leg day, but you gotta be real strong after this. And you got a little bit smarter, so you didn't have to be like double plus extra strong, right? Unconventional method, but it's effective. I give him points. <laughs> Part two, Viet Guam. Oh, that sounds much nicer. <laughs> Once San Antonio was in Papa Pirate's proverbial rearview mirror, he was on his way back home. 
Not for good, mind you, but for tech school. Yeah, I remember doing that. That was probably the, the chillest part. I got some stories about that. I think I talked about it in like my 5,000 subscriber special, but we should probably talk about it again. Because 5,000 subscribers, that was like a long time ago. That knowledge might be lost to time, except for some of the Red X lore keepers. Uh, anyways, he had done well enough on his aptitude test at the time of enlistment that he could have gone into any kind of job other than pilot. The Lord had seen fit to give him astigmatism so as not to bestow upon him the power of an airborne demigod. I mean, one man can't have all of that power, okay? <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not like me. I went into MEPS. They're like, look, your ASVAB score is so great. Oh, you're colorblind? Pick from these three jobs. <laughs> and my uh, method of picking was which one has a sign-on bonus? <laughs> Would the war have been over faster if Papa Pirate had been entrusted with an outrageously expensive piece of destructive equipment? You decide. I think we all know the answer to that. Instead, Papa Pirate elected to go into administration. Well, I, I guess that's one way to stay off the battlefield, isn't it? You don't want to get shot at? Sit behind a desk, <laughs> Papa Pirate. I figured it would give me the best chance of being in an air-conditioned building on a gated base away from the front line. A lot of those bases were guarded by South Korean troops, and the Viet Cong knew better than to mess with them. OP? Why, Papa Pirate? Well, the Koreans didn't play by the same rules, or any rules. When we interrogated someone, we just kept asking the same question a little louder each time. When they did interrogations, they did it at high altitude with at least two prisoners. The second guy would give answers before the first one hit the ground. Yeah, this, uh, against the Geneva suggestions, I guess. <laughs> Uh, okay, do what you gotta do, I guess. Nobody wants to be the first guy in hell. They might even throw the second guy out after him. Thanks for the answer, stupid. Bye. <laughs> anyway, Papa Pirate was at a tech school working as a typist when his commanding officer approached him with a promotion. One of the departments was falling behind on their work and needed someone that demonstrated the ability to quickly learn new technology. The CO? Coming down, approaching you personally? Well, hell yeah. That's a bit of an ego boost, isn't it? Thank you very much, sir. I'll head over there right away. Airman First Class Pirate spent the better part of the year learning the ins and outs of a cutting edge piece of technology that was big enough to fill an Olympic sized swimming pool. Some newfangled thing called a computer. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds weird. I don't think it's going to catch on. <laughs> By the time 1972 rolled around, senior airman Papa Pirate would have been quite content to ride out his last two years at a quaint little military base in the good old US of A. He was learning the ins and outs of computer programming, which apparently involved a bunch of paper cards with punch outs or something like that. Yeah, programming in the early days of computing is <laughs> just ludicrous, man. I'm so glad it's just so much easier now. They've got programs to help you program your programs, right? Who programmed those programs? Nobody knows. Somebody with punch-out cards, I guess. <laughs> now, Papa Pirate did try explaining this process, but I just smiled and nodded. My brain doesn't work quite the same as his. I more take after my mother, who was brilliant in her own way, and dare I say, a paragon of virtue. Well and truly, the nicest woman that you will ever meet. And I'm sure you're not just saying that because she's listening to it, right? Right? <laughs> Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, he was a bit too good to stay in this time zone. If ever someone wanted to posterize the phrase, good work is rewarded with more work, then Papa Pirate would be the child from whose face the artist drew inspiration. Yeah, that's why I always do everything half-assed. Don't even ask me about it. <laughs> uh, I'm good, man. The bare minimum is okay. We out here just skating. So Staff Sergeant Pirate packed his bags, all one of them, and eagerly, begrudgingly, made his way back across the Pacific. 
I mean, he is making rank, which is more than I can say I ever did in the Navy. But, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm only here for four years. Just ride it out. Bare minimum. That's the way to go. He stopped off for a brief Hawaiian vacation, 12-hour nap in a Hickam Field hangar, <laughs> before taking the last leg of his trip in first class, strapped to the back of a C-7-8 caribou with cargo netting. <laughs> Uh, and he would spend the next two years in the tropical paradise of Guam. And that part was not sarcastic. Papa Pirate says it was legit nice there. We're actually really close to Guam over in the Philippines. I might have to fly over there to process some residency paperwork for wifey and the kids, you know? We could take a little vacay. That might be nice. Papa Pirate swears that there aren't any good stories about his time in Guam. That's great. He was cold chilling, <laughs> as it's meant to be. And I trust him because I can say without exaggeration that I have never known the man to tell a single lie about anything other than the existence of a certain holiday-based dental and or stocking-based entities. Yeah, but that kind of gets a pass, doesn't it? He just wanted to help you believe in magic, right? <laughs> the friends Papa Pirate made in Guam would usually spend or gamble their pay as quickly as they earned it. Oof. Some even hopped a flight to Vietnam itself for a little moonlighting in Saigon on leave. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Papa Pirate, on the other hand, squirreled his earnings away. Each check gave him more money than he had ever been able to call his own before enlisting. As you may recall, he grew up so poor that he had to use pages from the Sears catalog as toilet paper. Papa Pirate, the regular pages worked well enough. They were just paper, but you didn't want to end up with one of the glossy ones. Yeah, the glossy ones don't work at all. You gotta form those into like some sort of scraper, right? Never mind, whatever. <laughs> uh, Guam, as Papa Pirate describes it, essentially just served as a truck stop between Hawaii and Vietnam. Papa Pirate's role at the base there was to lead a team of programmers whose job it was to archive maintenance and cargo records for the planes that were coming through. Still with the punch cards? God, that's tedious. <laughs> Can't we use pen and paper, please? Was it glamorous? No. Did he get shot at even one single time? No. Did they offer him another promotion to re-enlist? Yes. When he was doing his exit interview, or whatever it is, the officer asked if Papa Pirate would be willing to stay on stateside at the rank of technical sergeant with the promise of probably making master sergeant within a year. God, he climbed up those ranks super fast. Are you kidding me? I might be tempted, bro. Seems like a pretty cushy job, bro. But yeah, then you gotta like, you know, marry your gal and, and turn her into like a, a military wife. And that's never a fun way to do it, you know? You're like, okay, baby, I'll be back in two years. She's like, I'm pregnant. It's like, okay, well, I guess I'll see the kid when he's old. <laughs> it's wild. I don't think I like the thought of it. Civilian life is the life for me, honestly. Papa Pirate. I think Brigadier General Pirate sounds better than Master Sergeant Pirate. His military career then ended with the officer writing, not willing to re-enlist. <laughs> I mean, he was. You just got to send him to OCS. <laughs> Papa Pirate returned to civilian life with a uniquely marketable skill. It's probably the best part about the military, honestly. He had a job offer from First Citizens, in fact. Apparently, this whole computer thing was taken off, and banks, among other businesses, saw some practical application for this technology somewhere down the road. Well, gosh... Who would have thunk it? <laughs> he almost accepted the offer, but he saw it as risky. Yes, businesses were starting to clamor for people familiar with these massive machines, but private sector employment didn't offer ironclad job security. Papa Pirate knew how to use the current technology well enough, but he had seen how quickly this technology was growing and evolving, and what if it outgrew him? Would he still have a job in 10 years if the complexities of it outpaced his ability to learn? And that is one of the most difficult things about being a programmer, honestly. You can definitely keep up with it, but that is a full-time endeavor. Papa Pirate had been poor his whole life. He didn't see employment as a route to getting rich. 
He saw it as a means to a comfortable end. Job security mattered more than job salary to him. And so instead he settled for something that was less rigid than the military and more secure than the private sector. He became a government employee. Oh, good, great, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not a fan, but maybe Papa Pirate will change my view. Which agency? Well, I can't tell you. Even the most prodigious internet stalker doesn't yet have enough information to pinpoint Papa Pirate's identity. At least, I don't think they do. <laughs> this particular bit of information might be that one step too far. Is it an alphabet agency? Is Daddy in the FBI or the CIA? Is that why daddy's watching my videos? <laughs> you see what old Red is up to. Suffice it to say, he remained gainfully employed for decades to come. And no, the technology never did outpace his comprehension. But indeed, a, a good thing to be worried about. I think the government employment job was also the right move. Boys out here just doing the most. Uh, part three, marching powder with a side of summer teeth. Oh, finally. Somebody gets punched in the mouth. That's what I've been waiting for. <laughs> this last part isn't really related to Papa Pirate's military service, but it wouldn't really be a true ballad of Papa Pirate's story without a healthy dash of fisticuffs, right? I cauliflower his ear, bully! <laughs> Papa Pirate had an older brother that I hadn't mentioned before now. He was old enough to be Papa Pirate's dad, and he was never really an active player in Papa Pirate's life, so... It didn't merit a mention before now. Yeah, that's kind of the problem with an age gap, you know? I'm only eight years older than my sister and like, we were never that close. Cause she's eight years old, I'm, I'm 16. What do we have to really bond over? <laughs> uh, we talk a little bit nowadays though. We're trying to repair that a bit. But Uncle Elder was not the most attentive father to his kids. He had a very, once you're old enough to tie your shoes, I wish you the best of luck kind of attitude. <laughs> One of his sons was only a little younger than Papa Pirate. And by the end of the 70s, he had developed a fondness for fermented fluids and pale powders imported from particularly problematic countries in constant conflict on the southern side of the equatorial divide. Know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. To make hyperbolic use of the black sheep idiom, let's just say that party nephew, whoa! His fleece was a hue that would make Anish Kapoor start frothing at the mouth and threaten a lawsuit. <laughs> I love party nephew. Oh, we get to do the party demon voice, yay! <laughs> uh, Grandpa Pirate's health was failing. Papa Pirate was helping here and there with the bills, but he now had a wife and a daughter, so there were limits on just how much he could help. Enter church folk, stage left. Papa Pirate's church collected an offering to provide some financial relief to the pirate family. I mean, say what you will about church, but it does help you to become involved in the community. And then they can help you out, just like this. It wasn't exactly a fortune, but it was enough to help offset the loss of Grandpa Pirate's wages or at least it would have been, charitable donations only help when they make it to the hands of their intended recipients. Oh my God, dude. No one had dropped a dollar into this offering plate thinking, gee, I sure hope this makes it to the liquor store or a drug dealer, but find one of those destinations, it did. Party Nephew had taken it upon himself to reallocate those funds. Oh my God, dude, have you no shame? I mean, addiction is strong, but I give you two choices. Most people go up against the wall, but but for you, you can go to rehab or you can go up against the wall. Y you scumbag, you piece of dirt, your own grandfather. Terrible. Aside, one of my clinical certifications is specifically related to addiction, so I can understand on a logical level how addiction disrupts neurochemistry to change a person's priorities. I understand it's not as cut and dry as they are choosing to do this. Essentially, the neurochemical responsible for telling us to eat, form communities, and procreate is the one that says, you need crack more than you need oxygen. <laughs> That's about the shortest explanation I can give of it. 
That said, I can also see how stealing money from your sick grandpa to buy hooch and devil's dandruff is a duck move. <sighs> Papa Pirate found out that party nephew had taken the money and run. He asked around and was able to follow the trail to a not too distant locale, which was next town over. I don't know if he had found party nephew at the same bar that played host to the booze brother beatdown of 67, but I like to think that it was. Party nephew was reveling in his newfound fortune, elevated to a narcotic induced nirvana as he sipped the cheapest gut rot that the barkeep could offer. He was looking down at the counter, thinking, party nephew, what a great day to be alive. Whoa, hey, that counter looks like it's getting closer. The family exile hadn't expected to be hexed by the expiring restraint of an extremely vexed, not exactly, ex-boxer who wasn't exactly ecstatic about his extortion. Papa Pirate hadn't bothered announcing his arrival. Instead, he silently reflected on his youthful pastime of playing basketball and yielded control to muscle memory, thus bouncing party nephew's noggin off the bar. Good! <laughs> Did you learn something? He probably didn't learn anything. Party nephew recovering on the floor. Oh, what the fudge, Papa Pirate? Papa Pirate. Where is it? Party nephew. Oh, where's what? Whoa. Papa Pirate. You know darn good and well what? The money. Where's the money? Party nephew trying to wipe cheap whiskey off his shirt. You made me spill my drink. Papa Pirate, gripping Party Nephew by the collar of his shirt. I'll spill more than that if you don't tell me where the money is. <laughs> See, money does all this to family. <laughs> really, it's addiction that's doing this to family. I don't know why you do these things, Party Nephew. Whoa. <laughs> Party Nephew reached into his pocket and produced a few crumpled bills. It was less than a tenth of what had been collected. He had blown through most of it in the course of a single afternoon. Oh my God, man. No one moved to help party nephew as Papa Pirate rearranged his face. It had been years since Papa Pirate had bloodied his knuckles, but Grandpa Pirate didn't have the longest forecast to begin with, and this blatant theft could cut that strand of fate even shorter. Each punch thrown carried a drop of fear and sadness that Papa Pirate had been holding back. The barrage finally ended when Papa Pirate stopped to catch his breath. The barely recognizable lump of flesh staring up at him gave him a nonverbal, whimpering plea for mercy. Papa Pirate stood up and grabbed Party Nephew by his long overdue for a trim hair. The bruised and battered burglar blubbered as he bumbled along behind. Papa Pirate was entirely unconcerned about how it must have looked to a passerby. Someone had already called the law back at the bar. By the time the responding officer had taken the report and returned to the station, Papa Pirate would be waiting for him. Papa Pirate dragged his nervous and inebriated ne'er-do-well nephew to the counter and held him in place with a firm grip on the back of the bleeding boy's belt. He was fully prepared to confess to the assault and accept the punishment that came with it. Papa Pirate <laughs> beat him to a pulp. There, I'm helping with the alliteration. Desk officer, holy smokes, what happened? Party nephew, finally able to form words through his busted lips. He, he, he beat the snot out of me, whoa. Sheriff Matt walking in from behind. I would too. <laughs> Sheriff Matt had lost the word deputy at some point over the last decade. When he heard about the disturbance, he hazarded a guess as to who had been involved. Papa Pirate explained the situation Matt listened intently, and party nephew wet himself. Haha, <laughs> pee pee pants. <laughs> in the end, party nephew spent some recovery time in the county jail, and Papa Pirate just went home to ice his knuckles. God, just getting to know Matt, that was like one of the best time investments you ever made, wasn't it? You slipped out of a lot of trouble because you know that guy. <laughs> I'd like to say that this was the last time that addiction would plague Papa Pirate's family, but, well, much like the titular protagonist of our saga, I do not want to tell a lie. Oh, that's some heavy foreshadowing. Is it party nephew or is it, I don't know, a party uncle or something like that? Outro. 
I'm writing this paragraph last, but it's not the last one of the post. I scrolled back up to write this out before hitting submit. I spent half an hour trying to come up with a limerick or two like I normally do. If you've read or listened to the other parts, you know that I like to try and summarize the story in a couple of lighthearted bits of poetry. I can't do that this time. The words aren't coming to me. Even if they did, it would feel like laughing at a funeral, which might work for the bare naked ladies, but not for me. It's been one week since you lo looked at me. You know what I mean? Oh, that's such a good song. <laughs> the next few paragraphs are incredibly heavy. Heavier than the tragedy of Tiny Tim. Red, I know you always say I have to read it, but I'm telling you right now, you are not obligated to. If you choose to, then I'm telling anyone listening that you might just want to cut it off here. Pretend the last page of the story was just me talking about different whittling techniques and why a pair of stop cuts are superior to a single V-cut, in my opinion. Uh, anyways, here it goes. If it really goes that dark, I, I might cut it, but um, I feel like it needs to be included. Why did you write it out if, if it wasn't supposed to be included, you know? A a and I'm curious too. I gotta see. So I mentioned my sister once and only once. Oh man, it is gonna be heavy. We did talk about this in Discord DMs. I'm so sorry, Papa Pirate. All right. <sighs> once and only once when I was writing the Star Wars shenanigans saga, I didn't exactly give her a flattering description. In hindsight, I really wish I hadn't made light of what I, at the time, saw as a ridiculous situation. I don't know why I'm ending this on such a down note. As I was typing all this out, it sort of happened. I could highlight this, hit delete, and move on without a word about it, but I don't want to. My sister struggled with addiction for most of her adult life. She died earlier this year. Papa Pirate has always been my hero, even more so than Brandon Sanderson, and that's saying a lot for anyone that knows me. Even into adulthood, I've always just seen him as some adamantium skin superhero impervious to harm, limitless in his strength, unshakable. But this year has been hard on him. I've never seen him so hurt, so vulnerable. He started talking more about things, and a lot of these stories have come up when I've gone to visit and just sit with him. He's currently reading some chapters that I've written for a book that I want to get published. We've been watching Rings of Power together when it airs, those of you who read or listened to the tragedy of Tiny Tim will know the significance of that. I finally feel like I can repay a sliver of what he's done for me over the past 37 years. I wish that I could do more for him, and I wish that I had done more for her. If you're struggling with addiction, or if you even think that you might have a problem, please get help. Please reach out to somebody. The sad reality is that you might have burned bridges with the support system that you want, but that doesn't mean that the support isn't out there somewhere. If you have a loved one struggling with addiction, take that call. You don't have to give them money. You don't have to believe them when they say, I mean it this time, but I can tell you that you don't want your last thread of contact with someone to be a text message that says, please call dad. You don't want to have a voicemail of, hey, give me a call when you get a chance, to be a constant reminder of the fact that you let it go to voicemail. You don't want to spend the rest of your life wondering what would have happened if I had picked up. I'm sorry for ending the story like this. I really am. And again, I know how easy it would be for me to highlight this whole last section, hit a single key, and pretend that I didn't write it. Maybe this isn't the right place to air it. Ah, hell, I'm sure it isn't. But, well, maybe it is. I don't know. And I have no intention of going back to edit this. These are my thoughts. This is my stream of thought. This is the closest that you'll get to reading my mind. Are you having fun yet? I'm just now realizing as I put this into text that I am not okay. Addiction sucks. So don't give up. Please. Well, doing an outro after something like that uh, feels a little cheap. Weird. Do what you want, cause a pirate is free. You are a pirate. The Ballad of Papa Pirate. Vacations and vague threats. I can't remember which number we're on, but uh, it's probably in the title there. <laughs> Intro, sorry for the long break since the last entry in this red exclusive saga. 
Yeah, four months, it's been a minute, but we, we still right here. <laughs> I know it ended on a down note, but that wasn't really a factor in my unscripted hiatus. Glad to hear it, honestly. I realized full well that this might come across as someone saying, no, I'm fine, while swatting away a horde of rabid chihuahuas, but I am fine, honestly. This is to be the penultimate entry in the Ballad of Papa Pirate until and unless he does something new. He's currently raising my late sister's daughter and navigating custody waters with my nephew's sperm da- I mean, father. I won't go into detail about what's wrong with him, but to quote our titular hero, Papa Pirate, If I find out I've got three weeks to live, then he's got two. <laughs> That's a good one. If you're wondering, who is this Papa Pirate of whom you speak? Then I guess the YouTube algorithm might have navigated you in on the tail end of all this. If Red X has a playlist for this by now, I bet he'll put a link in the description, hashtag peer pressure. I've been doing this since part one. I've been pretty good about it, mostly. <laughs> if you don't feel like backtracking for context, well, that's fine, I guess. This installment doesn't build on the others as much since only the first half of the story is about Papa Pirate. Yes, indeed! You have activated my trap card. <laughs> uh, false advertising. This story's been censored for the sake of YouTube monetization, and Mama Pirate also wanting to enjoy the tale without any of those wordy dirds. <laughs> Part 1. The Sea World Spectacle. Imagine, if you will, how it would feel to be 10 hours into a Florida-bound road trip. I hate it already, thanks. <laughs> You're the only one that's old enough to drive apart from your wife who, God bless her, thinks that interstate speed limits are ironclad and it's safer to go five under, really. <laughs> that's me. Given her limited arm reach, she's only moderately successful at leg slapping your kids into maintaining a shaky peace treaty. So help me God, I will hit you with my ring hand. As it stands, you have an 11-year-old son with ADHD and a dead Game Boy arguing with a 13-year-old daughter who, like any freshly pubescent teenager, wants nothing more in the world than to be left alone and forget the rest of her family even exists. <laughs> it do be like that. You give me flashbacks of my, my trip to Manila a couple months ago. God, that wasn't even 10 hours. That was like two. Oh, I just can't do it. <laughs> You clear your throat meaningfully. <clears throat> An eerie, still silence lingers. You meet the children's eyes in the rearview mirror. Your eyes flit between the road and their panic-stricken visages. <laughs> You've now sent a message, loud and clear. You have to do this another dozen or so times before you finally bring the horde to its destination, SeaWorld. Oh, the sacrifices parents make, right? <laughs> you are Papa Pirate. You and Mama Pirate put a lot of planning and effort into this trip. Your patience is frayed by the time your sandals touch the blistering asphalt of the parking lot. The fires of hell itself radiate from that unforgiving sea of pitch and tar as the van empties its occupants before you. You are Papa Pirate. Today is going to be fun, or else. <laughs> Far too relatable. We're gonna create some happy memories, so get in this picture and smile, damn it! <laughs> the year was 1996. Papa Pirate had corralled his wife and reprobates into the family van at 4 a.m. and driven due south with only a handful of stops for snacks and drinks and bathroom breaks or maybe just a rousing game of scream into the abyss as your present circumstances mock the future that you had envisioned for yourself. <laughs> every night, every night I play that game. The fact that he didn't murder anyone on the way to the park was a testament to his self-control. We were all tired, but it was he alone that had endured the driver's seat. Honestly, he had earned the right to be ill-tempered. <laughs> he loved his family, though. Yeah, he'd get snippy and give us the look, TM, but we knew that he wouldn't hurt more than our pride. He's a good dad, good dad, just doing what he can to keep these kids in line. Of course, 
Not everyone who encounters Papa Pirate knows the man behind the stoic stare. Not everyone who crosses his path knows the manner of path that they have crossed. Not all who interact with our living legend do so knowing who or what he had been in his younger years. But we do, don't we, friends? <laughs> we entered the park with a plan. Mama Pirate, armed with a print-off of Showtimes and a map of the park, set out ahead of us to lead the way, right in front of a family having their picture taken. Again, this was the 90s. Digital cameras weren't really commonplace. Cell phones were just cameraless bricks of indestructible granite that could send and receive calls, but not much else. And they could play Snake. That's their most important function. <laughs> <laughs> this meant that most pictures were taken on rolls of film. Film that wasn't free. It wasn't exactly expensive, mind you, but it wasn't free. Some folks would just say, oh well, an innocent mistake. We'll just have a picture of some random lady looking down at a piece of paper while her family follows behind like a bunch of restless lemmings. The father of the family we had interrupted, however, was not one of those types of folks. Angry Dad, thanks for ruining our picture. Mama Pirate, embarrassed, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Angry Dad, sorry doesn't change the fact that we just wasted film because you didn't watch where you were going. Bro, what? You want to start out today with a fat lip? <laughs> That's what you're telling me? Papa Pirate steps in between Angry Dad and Mama Pirate. She said she was sorry. It was an accident. Calm down. Fun fact. The words calm down are paradoxically likely to make people angry or angrier 98.7% of the time. Also, 70% of statistics are completely made up on the spot. <laughs> angry dad. Hey, don't tell me to calm down. You ruined our picture. Hey, you wasted our film. Bro, my wife looks better than your raggedy ass family anyways, right? <laughs> you wanna do something about this? Let's go. I get kicked out of SeaWorld within two minutes of walking in. <laughs> Papa Pirate instead does the right thing. He pulls out his wallet. You're right, we did. Film is, what, five dollars a roll? Angry Dad. Not here it's not. Ah uh, yes, good old amusement park price gouging. Five dollars for a bottle of water? No problem! <laughs> Papa Pirate offers Angry Dad ten dollars. Here, that should cover it. Angry Dad snatches the money. Eh, fine, but you better watch where you're going from now on. Yeah, you too, bucko. Papa Pirate just says, Sure thing. Our families start to drift apart. It wasn't until this lull in the encounter that I noticed how similar our clans were. Each had a mother and a father. Each had an older daughter who looked like she wanted to spontaneously combust into a puff of smoke and drift away, never to be seen by human eyes again. And both families had a younger son who was taking a keen interest in the goings-on between their fathers. All right, good, fair, even fight? Let's do this. <laughs> now, if you've never been a little boy, I will let you in on an unspoken tradition. Regardless of whether their fathers are best friends, complete strangers, or mortal enemies, they are contestants in a hypothetical gladiatorial blood sport. From the dawn of time to the distant future, a game has existed behind the scenes among young men the world over. In ancient Rome, they would say, Pater meus pontuit vinceret pater teus, according to Google Translate. In the future, they'll say, Mavada pon yarvada, <laughs> according to my nonsensical prediction. But today, as in the 90s, we here in the good old US of A say, My dad could beat up your dad. <laughs> Mavada pon yarvada. <laughs> uh, I met other boys' eyes, which seemed to swim with smug satisfaction. Papa Pirate had apologized. Any true man, heavy sarcasm implied, of course, knows that apologizing is a sign of weakness. Moreover, Papa Pirate had given Angry Dad money as compensation. Could there possibly be a greater show of weakness? 
aside, I now look back at this and think, Jesus tap dancing Christ, that is one of the chattiest things that I have ever seen. Honestly, to me, yeah, it is. It's like you're brushing off a popper. <laughs> you're like, here, take this $10 and leave me and my family alone. You're not even worth interacting with. Money means less to me than you do. <laughs> Super chadly. But the engagement was over. In his ignorant young mind, Irish pirate had lost. At least until Angry Dad pocketed the cash without a word of reconciliation, Papa Pirate had offered an apology and even overpaid for an innocent mistake. Papa Pirate turned back to us and muttered under his breath, Papa Pirate, Jackass! Angry Dad spun on his heels, his voice cracking in anger as he said, Angry Dad, What the fork did you just say? Have you ever witnessed something in slow motion? Not like in a movie, but in real life. I've only had it happen to me twice, and this was the first time. Oh, fudge. I swear. It felt like everything was moving at a crawl as Angry Dad closed in on Papa Pirate from behind. Papa Pirate stopped and started lifting his right hand even before Angry Dad had started balling up a fist. The mothers watched in horror as their husbands rolled for initiative. <laughs> Angry Dad's wearing a fanny pack. That's minus three to initiative. And like minus 50 to charisma. Hey, if you guys checked out my life RPG project, I'd appreciate that. Also subscribe to this Red X stuff if you haven't already. Thanks so much. <laughs> the daughters drifted somewhere over Tampa, blissful in their new status as lost-esque smoke monsters, or at least they really, really wanted to. Yeah, hormones a hell of a thing. <laughs> the sons, well, we held our breath as an answer started to rip its way through the border between hypothetical and actual. We would soon see whose pater would actually vincerette. <laughs> Papa Pirate didn't form a fist. He raised an open hand as he spun around. Hell yeah, knife hands! That's the most military thing I ever seen. <laughs> if he had hesitated for even a moment, he would have been on the receiving end of a sucker punch. As it was, however, he caught Angry Dad's fist and clamped his outstretched fingers down on the offending appendage. Angry Dad's eyes went wide as Papa Pirate rolled his wrist and yanked down. I watched in morbid delight as Papa Pirate used his grip on Angry Dad's fist to twist his arm at an unnatural angle and pull him in close. He could headbutt Angry Dad with ease from this position he could twist harder and send this man into a howling fit of pain. He could add this man's name to the Tooth Fairy's route. <laughs> it was summer after all. And Papa Pirate is nothing if not adept at giving the gift of summer teeth. Summer over here, summer over there. <laughs> uh, but he's a bigger man than that, isn't he? Honestly, I couldn't help myself. Then again, I mean, your whole family's there. You don't really want to set that example for the kids. Papa Pirate really is just such a chad, isn't he? <laughs> Angry Dad squirmed a little before Papa Pirate silenced him with a guttural growl. Papa Pirate, When I let you go, you need to walk away. Enjoy your vacation. Spend your time with your family. I've had a long drive and I don't need this stuff. <laughs> Mama Pirate, both of you, stop it. You're acting like children. Is this the kind of example that you want to set for your kids? Mama Pirate's voice soothed the savage beast and nudged him back into the dark corner of Papa Pirate's subconscious where it had slumbered for years. Papa Pirate loosened his grip on Angry Dad's fist and took a step back as he let go. He didn't relax, though. He took, well, a stance. A posture that is in the unmistakably expressed readiness to fight. I had never seen it before. This was before Papa Pirate had started telling me stories about his youth. I had always known my dad to be a quiet, reserved computer programmer that split his time between his job, his wife, and his children, and the never-ending supply of books. This was the first time that I realized that 
My dad had an entire backstory about which I knew nothing. But I did know something. Judging by his now crimson expression and inability to meet my eyes, other boy knew it as well. My dad could, in fact, beat up his dad. <laughs> that is important to little boys, isn't it? Angry dad got punked real hard. I, I love to see that. He probably lays awake at night and thinks about it. <laughs> it keeps him up two decades later. That time you look like a total bitch in front of your kids at SeaWorld. <laughs> uh... Ah, oh, part two, emulation and humiliation. So after the SeaWorld spectacle, I asked Papa Pirate a few questions. A few hundred questions, actually. I started to get some stories out of him here and there, and you've already read or listened to the juiciest of them. There were also other bits of mischief scattered hither and thither, but Papa Pirate's time spent as a pint-sized vigilante held some special significance to me. I mean, it's relatable. You was a kid once, I'm a kid right now. I was the sort of kid that Papa Pirate would have protected in his youth. I was bullied maliciously, consistently, daily, multiple times daily, in fact. It was so bad that I would come home in tears when they finally picked me up from school. I had nightmares for years where I would get into a fight and I would move in slow motion while everyone else would go full speed. If I threw a punch, it was like I was throwing it underwater. Slow, weak, easy to dodge or deflect. I now know that that was my mind manifesting subconscious feelings of vulnerability and powerlessness in my sleep. Which is probably more common for kids since they are pretty vulnerable and powerless. <laughs> but my school had no Papa Pirate. I was on my own. Yeah, I had a few friends, but they could only do so much. Most of the abuse I suffered was verbal. They would sling insults back, but by the time I started crying, well, the damage was already done. Bro, never let them see you sweat. If you gotta cry, go to the bathroom or something. That's my tip for the day. My parents had different philosophies on how to handle all this. My mom urged a path of non-violence, assuring me that in a few years I would never have to see those kids again and it would all be behind me, that I didn't need to care what they thought of me. She told me that if I got into a fight, I could get expelled and then I'd have to go to a new school and it could affect my chances of getting into college and so on and so forth. I mean, she meant well, but she made me terrified that the consequences of fighting back would be worse than the consequences of just enduring this maltreatment. It was only words, after all. No one was physically attacking me. Honestly, the verbal scars can last a lot long. I'd rather be physically attacked. You know, that whole sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can stunt emotional growth and leave lasting trust and confidence issues that linger for years until you finally see a therapist in your mid-20s and Bit by bit, you reach the point where you can put it uh, mostly behind you and then become a therapist yourself. But you still go absolutely ape poop on bullies whenever and wherever you see them being total crap sacks. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it's a little too on the nose, isn't it? Dad wanted me to fight back, but he couldn't outright encourage it without undermining my mother. To this day, he says he regrets not taking that risk. Mama Pirate now says she wholly regrets the way that she handled my bullying and wishes she hadn't been quite so zealous about her approach. But this is now, and that was then, and then I was afraid to so much as meet insult for insult. And honestly, that's probably why it continued. If you snap back, if you lash out, it'll be over in no time. They don't want somebody who fights back. So yes, OP grinned and bared it. Until puberty, at least. Like I said, them hormones, boy. <laughs> See, when you get bullied a lot, you end up having these revenge fantasies, or in my experience, full conversations with your bullies. You take a lot of time to think about the hurtful things they said and obsess over what could I say that would counter that? What could I say that would hurt them like they've hurt me? And what ends up happening is you develop an entire arsenal of quips and comebacks and slights 
and after enough imaginary arguments, you gain the ability to bit by bit use them. One of the things my friends liked about my character in the Star Wars shenanigans saga was that he was quick-witted and sarcastic. I could respond to comments they or Hutbeard made immediately with bitter little barbs. I saw a couple comments about the Star Wars shenanigans. They're like, I wish your character was canon. And honestly, probably would have been better than anything that Lucas wrote. <laughs> I mentioned all this to say that the quick wit I used in that campaign wasn't something I was born with. It was something that I had to develop, hone, and practice to defend myself since I was being constantly reminded that violence isn't the answer. This did, however, get me into trouble. In the eighth grade, a tragedy befell my school. One of the students that had been bullying me since moving to the area in third grade had been out with some of his high school friends over the weekend. They had borrowed one of their mom's cars. They had also gotten into her liquor cabinet. They were drinking and they were driving at the same time. By now, I'm sure you've deduced what the tragedy was. The car crashed and my bully died. Jesus, that's a whole swirl of emotions right there. Are you allowed to be happy about that? <laughs> I probably feel guilty. Be like, yes, I'm delighted, but also that's pretty messed up that it's, <laughs> it's making me so happy. That Monday, the school had a period of mourning. I excused myself to the bathroom during the moment of silence. And I'm not proud to admit this, but I'm not going to lie to you guys. I cried. Tears of joy. Yes. And you shouldn't feel guilty about it either. Like I said, whole swirl of emotions. There's a lot to get into here. I know. Sick, right? Not sick. Honestly, understandable. Justifiable. Little 13-year-old Irish pirate crying with relief because another child in his class was dead. I know. Trust me, not really a healthy reaction, but I'm not going to sugarcoat things and pretend that I'm perfect. It was a screwed up reaction. Was it? <laughs> I don't know, I can totally see it. But then again, I'm not the healthiest person on the planet either. <laughs> I'm just a bitter old man at this point. I returned to class a while later and was a little confused. This was English class. Why was everyone getting markers and cardstock? Why was my bully's girlfriend unrolling a massive piece of paper onto the floor? Ew. <laughs> I made my way back to my seat and turned to a familiar face. OP, what's everyone doing? Mac, who, if you didn't read the Star Wars shenanigans saga or listen to it, it's 11 hours long, he was my best friend since second grade. They're making cards for Bully's family. OP, do we have to? <laughs> Mac, no. OP, are you? Mac, I don't know, maybe. Uh, I do feel bad for his parents. OP, I don't know, they should have raised him better. Yeah, I know. OP, I'm not going to let you shoulder the, the blame for this. I wouldn't have made that little f***er the card either. <laughs> I don't remember if Mac did end up making a card for them, but I know that I most certainly did not. I spent my card and marker time drawing a kick-ass dragon. <laughs> time much better spent, honestly. Eventually, Bully's girlfriend made the rounds with the fruits of her labor, a massive card for Bully's parents. Something for the whole class to sign. I barely looked up from my dragon when she got to my desk. Bully's girlfriend offering me the card. Hero P, this is for Bully's family. Now, before I get into my response, I just want to clarify something here. Bully's girlfriend was cruel, vain, and manipulative as hell. Her watery eyes had no impact on me. The fact that she casually came up to me and said my name as if we were friends was downright insulting to me. How dare she use my name like that? I mean, you're really feeling a certain type of way about all this, but yeah, let them know. Let them know. <laughs> we're talking about a girl who found out that I had a crush on one of her friends and got the friend to ask me to a school dance just so they could all share a laugh at my expense when I showed up. And they said, I can't believe you thought she was serious. 
And of course, that incident absolutely axe-murdered my ability to tell if someone is actually flirting with me. When I first met my wife, she introduced herself by tugging the back of my hair and saying, wifey in a chipper tone, Hi, who are you? I didn't identify that as flirting. A couple of weeks after we had been talking for a while, she said, My parents are going to be out of town this weekend. My stupid self said, Oh, cool. I love when I get the house to myself. Have fun. <laughs> uh, oof. Yeah, judge away. Anyways, Bully's girlfriend said, Did you hear me, OP? This is a card for... OP? Oh, I heard you. Bully's girlfriend, confused. Oh, uh, okay. Well, can you go ahead and sign it? OP? Nope. Bully's girlfriend. But why? OP? Because I don't want to. Bully's girlfriend. But... You have to! Everyone is signing it! OP, not me. I'm not doing it. Bully's girlfriend to the teacher. Teacher! OP said he's not gonna sign the card! Teacher, who knew full well the way that I've been treated. Well, it's not mandatory. He doesn't have to sign it if he doesn't want to. Bully's girlfriend is now crying. How could you be so mean? OP, wow, really? Are you serious? I'm the mean one? Bully's girlfriend, it's just a card. OP, yeah, a card for someone who picked on me every single day for like five years. Bully's girlfriend, but his family. OP, I don't care about his family. They're the ones that raised him. Bully's girlfriend, but he's dead! OP, good! I'm glad he's dead! And I wish you had been with him! Oh boy, this is getting really spicy really fast, isn't it? <laughs> uh, maybe wind it back just a little bit. It was at this point that I got sent to the guidance counselor. Yeah, I guess I could have seen that one coming. <laughs> okay, so you said this is a Papa Pirate story. Is... Is he gonna come back, or? Yes, he is, I'm getting there. Keep your pants on, please, thanks. Or not, I'm not gonna tell you how to live your life. Good, because I record all of these without pants. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> the fun wasn't over yet. After I was given a couple hours of public education quality therapy, <laughs> I was returned back to the wild. A jungle, with one fewer predator, at least. The problem you see is that, well, the other predators had heard about what I said. I barely made it two steps into the locker room for gym class when I came face to face with one of my bully's bestest of best friends. Best friend? I heard what you said. I'm gonna kick your butt. This was like two years after the trip to SeaWorld, and by this point I had been told all about the man behind the curtain, and I wanted to live up to Papa Pirate's legacy. Part of me wanted to throw down, but the other half was a bit more cautious. Mama Pirate had told me for years to avoid fights at all costs. Papa Pirate had wanted to bestow a more direct solution to the bullying, but the best he could offer without going directly against Mama Pirate's admonition was, Papa Pirate, Don't throw the first punch, but don't let them throw the second. With a curious mix of anger, fear, and unfounded confidence, I said, Irish pirate, I won't throw the first punch, but unfortunately there would be no but. <laughs> Bright lights and a sharp pain shot all the way from my nose to the base of my spine and back up again. My Papa Pirate impression had been interrupted by a sucker punch. Is everyone in these stories just like a sucker punch and jerk? I guess, but they always get their comeuppance, so that's good. I've said time and time again that I strive for full honesty in these stories, even if it's embarrassing and painful. Well, I can think of few situations that would be more embarrassing, painful, painfully embarrassing, or embarrassingly painful than needing your 8th grade gym coach to run a crowd off so he can free you from the janitor's closet. <laughs> yeah, that's a core memory for sure. Very unfortunate. So I sat outside the principal's office with a bag of ice held to my nose. 
My assailant was on the other side of the door, giving his side of the story. I had never actually heard him upset before. It sounded like he was actually crying as he explained that I had said some really cruel things and he just lost his temper and blah, blah, blah. And I sat there with a grin. Yes, I had been taken out of a fight that I didn't know I was walking into in not but a single blow. Yeah, I crumpled like a dorm room coffee table made of pizza boxes when introduced to any appreciable amount of weight, but I had gotten to them. I had gotten to all of them. They had all made fun of me for being a sensitive little crybaby for years. Yes, I had once again found myself crying in school, but they didn't just mock me. I had crossed the line, apparently, and they now hated me. So why did I smile? Because I was at peace with that. I also learned on that day that I could hurt them back, but with words. It would take years for me to hone that skill. You end up finding ways to learn about people's insecurities. You have confrontations with them in your head and work out the most sarcastic and hurtful way to bring those insecurities to light. But let's be honest here. When you found out that your 10th grade bully's parents are getting a divorce, it's really tempting to go over and tell him that it's all his fault. <laughs> uh, see, that's the level of pettiness that I'm on. It is beautiful. Who among us wouldn't follow that up by asking which one had lost the custody battle and gotten stuck with him? <laughs> oh, that is just malicious and cruel and I love to see it. <laughs> uh, where was I? Anyways, oh yeah. Being at peace with all the bullies is hatred. What I wasn't at peace with was the look on Papa Pirate's face when he stepped into the lobby. He was still in his aviators and tucking them into the pocket of his suit jacket. Oh, looking fresh. He signed the visitor's log and came over to me. He was about to sit when the door opened and my attacker stepped out, escorted by his mother. A mother who apparently knew Papa Pirate from their own school days. They exchanged emotionless hello and goodbyes as we traded places and I stepped into the lion's den. It's gonna be fine, OP. You got the power of God and anime on your side. And Papa Pirate too. <laughs> Vice Principal. Um, thank you for joining us, Papa Pirate. Uh, OP, I I'd like to hear your side of what happened. Did I want to share? Hell no. I was sitting next to my hero. A hero that would have taken Bully's best friend and half the school on in a fight and emerged victorious. My tale was... Well, it was pathetic. Irish Pirate. I went into the locker room and Bully's best friend threatened to beat me up. I told him I wouldn't throw the first punch and then I got hit in the face and thrown into the janitor's closet, vice principal. And before that, I gave my account and I didn't leave anything out. I admitted what I had said to Bully's girlfriend. Papa Pirate said nothing. He just listened and watched. The vice principal was the one to finally break the silence. Vice principal. Well, that lines up with what he and Bully's girlfriend said, so, uh... Two days detention. Papa Pirate. For the boy that hit him? Vice Principal. No, for, for Irish Pirate. The way I see it, he instigated that fight. Papa Pirate. Did you miss the part where the kid said he would beat him up? Vice Principal. No, and he's gonna be punished as well, but Irish Pirate threatened him back. On top of the things he said earlier that were just in insensitive and inappropriate. Papa Pirate. I will talk to him about what he said, but he's not going to detention for this. Vice Principal. He was involved in a fight. Papa Pirate. He was ambushed. Vice Principal. Papa Pirate, I, I can see this is upsetting you, but he said something very inappropriate. The other boy shouldn't have hit him, but... Uh, but what OP said? Papa Pirate. You're right! This is upsetting me! So let me ask you something! Vice Principal. Uh, okay. Papa Pirate. I think what you're saying is inappropriate. These kids have been picking on OP for years! If he says he's glad one of them died, he has his own reasons! You call it inappropriate. I call it being honest. 
Inappropriate is giving him the same punishment as the kid who hit him. Vice Principal. Sir, whether he hit back or not, he was involved in... Papa Pirate. This is going to sound like a threat. It's not. It's a question. And I want you to think about it before you give your answer. What would happen if I hit you right now? Vice Principal paling a little. W what? Papa Pirate. If I stood up, walked around your desk, and punched you in the face the way that kid punched OP, what would happen? Vice Principal. Uh, I I'd call the police. Papa Pirate. You wouldn't hit me back? Vice Principal. Um, I... Uh... Papa Pirate. Let's say you didn't. I hit you. You don't hit back. You call the police. I get arrested, right? Vice Principal. Yes. Papa Pirate. But not you, right? Vice Principal. Uh, I don't think so. Papa Pirate. Why not? You were involved in the fight. Vice Principal, finally piecing it together. God, he ain't too bright, is he? <laughs> uh, Papa Pirate, I, I get what you're saying, but... Papa Pirate. What I'm saying is that this whole he was involved in a fight thing is a load of crap. And you know it. That's not how the real world works. If they were adults, that kid would be arrested and OP would be free to go. Vice Principal. But, um, that, that, that's different. Papa Pirate. Because they're kids, right? Vice Principal. I'm trying to teach OP that there are consequences for, for saying things like that. Yeah, next thing you're going to tell me that words are violence. <laughs> Papa Pirate. That's the stupidest thing you've said so far. And I thought for sure you couldn't top. He was involved in a fight. Pointing to my nose, he said, you see his nose? That's the lesson. He's already learned it. Vice Principal. Uh, that's not... Uh, I didn't... The school has to address it on our end. Papa Pirate. No, they don't. You have to address it because you want to feel powerful. You keep saying my son was inoffensive and inappropriate. You're actually blaming him for the fight. If you give him detention for being involved in a fight, then we are going to have a problem. Vice Principal. I... Uh, okay. Okay, one day of detention for what he said earlier. Uh, that he was glad that one of our students was dead. Papa Pirate rolled his eyes. Fine. Tomorrow. Vice Principal. Mm, yeah. Papa Pirate walked me to his car. I climbed up in the passenger seat, horrified at what had happened. I was such a weak, pathetic little runt that he had to leave work early to come and pick me up and sort me out. <sighs> I wasn't like him at all. Not when it came to courage and confidence, at least. Not when it came to defending myself. I mean, it's not really even your fault, OP. You got some, some people dragging you down and giving you the wrong response to stuff like this. Grin and bear it? It doesn't work for bullying, all right? They're just gonna turn up the heat, so you have to fight back. It's the only way. I'm sorry, but it's the only way. The 20-minute drive home felt like 20 hours. I didn't break the silence until we got back. It took me the whole drive to work up the courage to say anything to Papa Pirate. Papa Pirate unfastened his seatbelt and started to get out of the car. OP, I'm sorry. Papa Pirate. For what? OP. For, I don't know, causing a problem? Saying stuff like that? Papa Pirate. What you said was uh, probably not something you should have said at school. But you weren't wrong to say it. It's how you felt. You were just being honest. OP. Yeah, but it caused the fight. It's my fault that Papa Pirate. No, this is my fault. Your mother keeps telling you that fighting isn't the answer, and, well, I don't agree with her. Honestly, I don't either. She did the best that she could, you know? But boys handle stuff different from girls. Get in a couple fights and win or lose, I swear your confidence is going to go through the roof because you're not scared to throw hands. <laughs> OP, you tell me all these stories about getting in fights when you were younger and standing up for people, standing up for yourself, and I want to. 
I want to be able to do all the things that you've done, but I don't even know how to throw a punch. Papa Pirate stared at me. His eyes flitted back and forth between mine. I don't know what he was looking for. The only things there to find were fear and shame, as far as I could tell. But finally, he nodded. Papa Pirate. All right, drop your stuff off in your room, and then come meet me in the barn. OP. Why? Papa Pirate. So I can teach you. Yes, and so it begins. Training montage, go! We're gonna need a montage. montage. A sports training montage. There once was a man on a trip who almost got punched in the lip. His son gave a grin and said, my dad wins, as he kept his foe's fist in a grip. <laughs> there was once a meek little guy who made a few mean people cry, was sprung from detention, and then for prevention, would learn how to let a fist fly. It's the right move, it's the right thing, honestly. It seems uncouth, but hey, we're a bunch of hairless monkeys deep down. <laughs> Sometimes we gotta hit each other. Postscript, I had a quote unquote doctor's appointment an hour into the school day that I was supposed to serve detention. Papa Pirate signed me out, and we spent the day eating ice cream and watching Quantum Leap. The next day, Vice Principal said I needed to go back to the detention room since I hadn't served a full day. I said I wanted to call my dad first. For some reason, he had a change of heart and just sent me back to class. What a little worm. Although I guess this is the state of public education these days. This whole, oh, zero tolerance policy for violence, <laughs> including the person that is having violence inflicted upon them. It's ridiculous. Your dad definitely did the right thing. He's sending a message right now, teaching you how to stand up to authority and not listen to every word that's flung at you. Papa Pirate, he's a real OG. I can't be mad at Mama Pirate either. She did what she thought was right. But yeah, generally boys experience pretty different. <laughs> you gotta get in the fight a time or two, at least in my experience. I'm glad all turned out well and I'm loving these stories. Second to the last does make me sad, but then we'll be able to compile all these into a compilation and you know I love that. I know you guys love it as well. Thank you so much for listening along with me. I hope you like, comment, subscribe, uh, share the video around if you haven't done any of those things. Check out my links in the description. Follow me on everything. Thank you so much to my beautiful Patreon supporters, my lovely channel members. I want you guys to always remember that you are loved, you are worthy, you definitely, definitely deserve it. And I shall see you in the next one. So until then, friends, bye-bye.